Hi. Hello. Uh, I want to give people a few more minutes to kind of start shuffling in. Where'd it go? There it is. Kind of put all my stuff together over here. I know that there's probably a noise in the background. Krista, hello, Midnight, or er, Kata, Midnight Fox, whichever one you go by. Flowers, hello, hello, hello. Those follows that came in while I was getting set up, thank you for those. Who was that? There was a couple of them. Uh, Jaws, Frasier, and Crypto Comics. Thank you very much for those uh, follows. So I've got like two fans going because it's hot. So we'll give people a couple more minutes to uh, come in. Oh, my stuff's covering up the, uh, oh, it bounced right out of the cup too. Stuff's covered up in a way I don't like. Let's put that back on top. There we go. Now it's back on top. Kato, thank you very much for that follow. So right off the bat, Hello. Hi, my name is Milesy. Uh, there's going to be a lot of new people in here, so I'll take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, I do cross-stitch embroidery and a bunch of other somewhat related crafts on this channel. I have a store on Dealer's Den and another one on Comicio. You can get everything's all linked together. You can do exclamation a website in the chat to get my website, and everything is organized nice and neatly. I'm kind of spread out on the internet just because that seems to be the best way to do it. Uh, today we are doing a panel on a beginner's guide to cross stitch, which I think at one point today was uh, listed as a tutorial. It's kind of not. I'm not sure what we'd call this. Um, more of a crash course, I think. Also, you'll notice on this... Nope. That side, there we go. <laughs> right there. Uh, my webcam is backwards from how I normally have it. Uh, right there, there's a couple of little things kind of on top of the chat. The first one is a fundraiser we are doing for Hero Rats. Uh, they're an organization that trains rats to sniff out landmines. A single rat can, cl uh, can clean a landmine field in 20 minutes when it takes a human technician three or four days to do it. So they've got rats that are trained to do that. They're too light to set off the landmines. So they're over in areas uh, in the Middle East, in Asia, in uh, other affected areas, clearing out landmines. They're also trained to sniff out tuberculosis ser uh, samples in blood serum in areas where the technology to do that in a lab is either too expensive or the area is too remote. So they use rats to help narrow down what they need to actually be properly testing. The rats can sniff out the samples very, very quickly. Uh, so we're raising money for them. We're trying to get $300 by the end of the uh, weekend. And if we do, like the uh, Australia campaign we did a few months ago, if we hit that goal, I will be adopting a rat for the channel. Uh, we've also got, it's on this side, it's on my other side, uh, we've also got a Kickstarter going. And we are right now uh, raising money to put out a line of craft kits for beginners. We've funded about 145 kits so far. Um, and these aren't just individual kits, these are kit designs. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many individual kits are going out. There's a lot of cross-stitch. We just finished funding purlers, so purler kits will be going out as well. And right now, we are working towards seed bead kits. So you can check that out. You can get to the rats with hero, exclamation hero rats. You can get to the Kickstarter with exclamation Kickstarter. Now, I think that has been enough time to give people a little bit of chance to shuffle in. So let's talk about what we're doing today. Uh, we are doing a panel, seminar, crash course, I don't know what we're going to call this. Uh, I've called it a beginner's guide to cross stitch because this is one of those hobbies that is very easy to get into. It's, uh, it can be very expensive to get into if you 
jump in on the deep end. Uh, but it's also really intimidating to get into because there's a lot you need to know. And one of the things that we've been talking about in this community for years is how there seems to be a tendency where it's hard to find what you need to look up. It's really hard to research something if you don't already know what you're trying to research. It's a really weird paradox that I don't think is ever going to get solved. And with cross stitch, there's a lot of really specific information that you need that you don't know that you need. It's a really big problem. Uh, we're in our discord. We're very slowly working on putting together a glossary uh, that will be released eventually. I'm not sure exactly what format we're going to be releasing it in, but today over the next few hours, I'm going to be taking you through everything you need to know to get started on the dirt cheap. Uh, this is absolutely a hobby that will destroy you. You can probably see over my shoulder right back there somewhere, having a hard time pointing at it right there, that white thing. Um, that's about $400 worth of fabric. <laughs> uh, I don't want to talk about the amount of fabric I have bought. You see those other big green bins? That's a couple thousand dollars at least worth of fabric. Don't even talk to me about the amount of money I've spent on floss. This is, can be, a really expensive hobby, but it doesn't have to be. It's expensive for me because I own a store, I take commissions, I make patterns, which means I have to stitch the patterns. So it's expensive for me. It's not so much expensive uh, to get into though. At least it doesn't have to be. Uh, I don't think my panel got announced either. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, everyone, can someone grab me my own Twitch link? <laughs> uh, everyone, a beginners. I thought someone else was gonna do this, but it didn't happen. A uh, guide to Cross Stitch is currently live. We'll be taking you through how to get into a new hobby on the dirt cheap without on the dirt cheap without uh getting too overwhelmed. Nobody got my link for me. Uh H Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I didn't have it open. I'm really bad at that. There we go. Okay. I thought someone else was going to do that, but there we go. Now it's up. So, it doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, what have I done? I've messed up my entire thing. Uh, so, one of the big questions that I get asked a lot, and also my desktop audio isn't on, I killed it. Uh, so one of the questions I get asked a lot is what can you create? The answer is literally anything. Lately we have been working on doing a lot of these little tiny things. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that the Kickstarter is going to be funding. Our tiny little beginner kits, very basic, very easy to do. Uh, so you can do these. You might have also seen in the Discord, I have been posting some really intense, almost photorealism. For example, let's get a smaller version of that because that's enormous. Here is a photorealistic possum I created at one point. Just put it right over my face, it can sit there. So the difference in what you can get is staggering. So. What can you create is pretty much anything you want. Uh, you're not limited to anything. I do a lot of really big, crazy projects. My trade name is Mad X Stitcher because I'm kind of insane with what I create by design. It's a lot of cool, uh, it's endless what you can create. Also, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them. And Slow Mo here, our mod, she's going to be collecting them for me and I will answer them at the end. So feel free to ask questions, uh, comment, anything you need down there. She'll be collecting everything. Forgot to mention that. So what you can create, anything you want. You're not really limited. The only limitation you have is 
the amount of floss that you have and the size of your fabric. Uh, the giant big white thing back there is, what is that? I want to say it's 60 inches by 10 yards. So it's, the, the limitations are ridiculous. So I'm not even close to using that. I think there's about eight yards of it left. Uh, you can probably see I've just been ch uh, cutting chunks of it off as I need. The floss is another thing, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, this is the floss that I use. There are 505 colors all right here in that. I have four of those. <laughs> so I am not super limited, although I am punching my microphone, but you don't need, most people don't need that amount of floss. Most people don't need four of those plus a giant dresser plus a giant box full of floss. Uh, I do. You probably don't. <laughs> So just keep that in mind. Uh, that's something I say a lot during my streams. Don't use me as a benchmark for anything because I'm insane. Now what you do need, obviously you need some floss. You need your fabric. You need a needle. And that is really all you need at the end. Uh, you do maybe need a pattern. You can wing it if you are confident and skilled enough. You can stitch without a pattern. Plenty of people do. Uh, plenty of pattern makers will actually stitch and make the pattern as they stitch. Another thing you'll see people talk about, it's not required, it's not even necessary, but it's helpful, are needle minders. And this is one that I have. I've got quite a few of them. What they are is it's a pair of magnets, one of which is usually de uh, decorated. This is, it's hard to see because my camera's not on autofocus. Uh, it's a guy crashing his bike on the train tracks. It's a common road sign you'll see in Portland. And then they've got another magnet. And what they do is put your decorated one on the front and then the plain one on the back. And it sandwiches on your fabric. It doesn't hurt or damage your fabric. And it holds on to your needle so you don't lose it and poke yourself in the ass which is, I think, something we've all done. So, <laughs> not necessary, not needed, but definitely helpful. But really, all you need is your floss, your fabric, and your needle. And floss is just the French word for thread. The reason we call it floss is because the biggest manufacturer in the U.S. is French. So, all of their skeins say floss, or however it's pronounced in French. I don't know, I'm not French. But that's why we call it floss instead of thread. So you can get your floss in a variety of ways and a variety of brands. The big one in the U.S. is DMC. That's the French brand. There's another brand called Anchor, which I think is a little bit bigger in Europe. I have some of it, but I don't come across it very often. I think that's one you'll find more in specialty stores. Although, unless you live in a city finding local needlework stores is very difficult i don't have one uh but the dmc or the anchor those are the most common ones dmc is becoming more common because of the internet uh, most pattern designers seem to be in the u.s uh, or russia not sure what that's all about i don't know what their floss is but for some reason pattern designers are either american or russian and as such, most of the floss that you'll see is DMC. Most of the patterns you get will be in DMC. You will find some in Anchor. Uh, other common ones are CXC and Royal Brodery. CXC stands for Chinese DMC equivalent or something. I'm not sure how it gets to that. Uh, and then Royal Brodery is the Chinese version of DMC. And I do actually rec recommend both of these. I wouldn't have put them on my list if I didn't. Uh, I've, I did an entire series on my YouTube channel on both of these and basically came to the conclusion that either one you buy, it'll be worth it. Uh, it'll be worth it. The difference is that CXC is a cotton poly blend where, uh, where Royal Brodery, unless you're getting like their metallics, the Royal Brodery is 100% cotton. And we're actually using Royal Brodery in our Kickstarter because it's cheaper and I can get a lot more of it for the money. 
uh, CXC is probably, I would say, the best one to get for a very beginner because it's color fast and light fast, which means that it won't, the colors won't bleed if you have to wash your project or if you have it out in the light because it's polyester. DMC, Anchor, and everything else I'm about to mention, the colors will run if you wash it. Even the name brand stuff, the colors will run. Uh, I, there's no way around it. I've seen so many people assume that because DMC is the stupidly expensive name brand, this crap's almost a dollar a skein for something this big. It's getting so expensive. People assume that because it's the name brand, you're safe. You have to be really careful when you wash it. If you have children, if you have pets, if you know you're going to have to wash it, if you're putting it on a t-shirt or something that you want to wash, I recommend CXC. I really do. Both it and Royal Rotary are color matched to DMC. A lot of times you'll get CXC that isn't labeled, so you want to make sure that you uh that you get that or that you check that. You can get both of those on Amazon very cheaply. Uh, you can typically get about 150 skeins for like 10 or 12 dollars, whereas this crap's like 70 something cents a skein. So you're saving a lot of money with that. Other ones that you can get fairly commonly in craft stores are Prism, Iris, and JNP. Now there are two different versions of JNP. There is a really high-end version, and then there's a really cheap version, and I don't seem to have and uh, yes, I do right here. Here's the cheap version, which they just look like this. Pretty basic stuff like that. They're all going to be the same size. So this is JNP. Uh, this is Yan Lin. That's another one I didn't have on my list. Uh, that's not one I recommend. That's a garbage one. Somewhere over here is a DNC skein. There it is. It's kind of an older one. But got, I've got so much floss on this desk. Here's another funky DMC. This isn't the kind that you'd want, but that is another DMC skein. But basically, they're all going to be very similar is what you should be getting out of this. They're between eight and nine uh, yards per skein. Uh, the ones that you can get in craft stores, Walmart, things like that, the JNP, the Prism, the Iris, they're okay. Most of them are meant for friendship bracelets though. So if you're trying to pull off a single strand, you might find that it tangles or breaks a lot more than the other ones I mentioned up above, the DMC and Anchor and the CXC and Royal Broidery. Those are meant for embroidery. The other ones tend to not be the exception, weirdly enough, um, and both, all three of these, Prism, Iris, and JNP, I think, all have their own, um, not metallic, UV line. There we go. They all have their own UV line, which this is not going to show up on camera. It never does, which is this really intensely neon floss. And we'll be talking a little bit more about this guy later. And you guys do not see the colors I see. The camera cannot physically pick up these colors. That is how intensely neon those flosses are. If you get the neon versions of those, they are designed for embroidery. For some reason, a lot of the actual just basic ones are not, so you want to be kind of careful with that. Now, there's also different types of floss that you can get. There is metallic floss, which is just awful in every way. Uh, the only metallic floss I've ever found that I enjoy using is Krynik and even some of those are questionable, and Royal Brodery has some really surprisingly good metallic floss. It feels disgusting. I had zero hopes for it, but, but it was actually some of the easiest uh, metallic I've ever used, which is ridiculous, and I don't uh, understand that at all. Uh, so that is something to uh, keep an eye out for. There's also satin floss, which is kind of a common one. It's really, do I have any? Yes, I do right here. It's really ultra shine is how I kind of explain it to people. And let me grab one out here. And you'll see it doesn't want to stay on the bobbin. It's really soft and it's super shiny compared to one that isn't. 
So there's one that isn't shiny, and you can really see the extra shine. This is another type that you can get. This is variegated floss. That just means that the floss is going to kind of change color. Uh, there's some that you can get that might be a little bit more iridescent for a different definition of color changing. But usually when people talk about color changing floss, they're talking about floss with uh, kind of different colors of stripes on it. I've got a few different types as well. Uh, it's not really worth going into every single thing. Most of these, the DMC, Prism, Iris, JNP, all of the specialty stuff, you can get those at Michael's, Joann's, Walmart will have them, uh, Amazon will have them all, everything. 123 Stitch has most of them. I don't think 123 Stitch carries the Chinese things. Um, I've also heard people say that they've got them on Wish, but I've never heard a single good thing about Wish, so I wouldn't recommend that. And then you'll, you probably saw that some of my floss was like this, and then some of it was wrapped around something. Again, this is one of those things that's not necessary to get, but it's helpful. Uh, that is what's called a bobbin. And they, they're usually white. Sometimes they're different colors. They come in a bunch of different sizes and styles. I've got, um, I've just pulled out three different brands right there from the same box. And they're pretty basic. They'll hold a single skein of floss. They might hold a little bit more. And it's so full that I can't close the box. There it goes. You can get these. Uh, I've just got it in a box here. You can get those pretty much anywhere. Amazon will sell them in bags of a thousand for dirt cheap. Uh, you can get them, again, Michaels, Joann, Walmart, anywhere that sells embroidery stuff will sell those. And they are designed to fit into a multitude of boxes. Again, this is uh, one of mine. I told you I've got four of them. Three of them are right here next to me. Uh, this is one... It's not really meant for embroidery. Bobbins like this, it's meant for a different type, but they just happen to hold quite a lot. Uh, there's another type that's about a quarter of the size that's more common, and I don't have a single one of them in reaching distance to me. I forgot to grab one. I've got a bunch of them. My husband uses one. He prefers it because they travel a lot better than these giant things do. Um, but when you've got an absolute stupid amount of floss, the bigger ones are better, basically. So, basically, whatever floss you want, I recommend for beginners, go on Amazon and you'll just search for embroidery floss and you'll get bombarded with all of these listings for 150 colors for $8 or something ridiculous. Get those. Uh, because you will save money and you will be able to learn on something that is not very expensive. Because one thing I've noticed, it doesn't matter what kind of art you're doing, what kind of craft, people tend to get really itchy about learning how to use something expensive because there's this idea that if it's expensive, you don't want to waste it. So when you're spending literal pennies on a bit of floss, it becomes a lot easier to experiment and mess around and make mistakes. So if you're just starting out, I honestly recommend the Chinese stuff on Amazon. It's great. I've used it. I recommend it. I have no problems with it. I'm using it in my Kickstarter. So go ahead and use that. If you want to start getting into more high-end stuff, then you want DMC and Anchor. There's also Krynik for metallics, which you, if you're starting out, I really do not recommend metallics at all. Even advanced stitchers hate that crap. It's not nice. Satin, advanced stitchers hate that crap. I will be showing you how to use variegated though, because that is not difficult to use. For the fabric, again, you can get it anywhere, Michaels, Joann, Walmart. Ridiculously though, there is a good reason for this. Joann will not sell you cross-stitch fabric by the yard, at least the vast majority of them don't. And I have spoken to several managers about this um, around the Portland area because there was a time where I was desperately trying to find cross-stitch fabric by the yard and wound up having to go about two hours away to find one, uh, to find a store that sold it. And the reason why Joann doesn't is because it's 
not a popular fabric. It's extremely niche use. And a lot of times people would buy it thinking it was something else and then get really angry. So Joanne will only sell it in pre-cut sections. You can't get it by the yard. Uh, on Amazon and 123 Stitch, you can get it by the yard. Uh, sometimes. Right now, everything's kind of on fire, so I wouldn't say you can get it right now. Uh, the most common by the yard fabric you'll find on Amazon is 14 and 18 count. Usually in white, sometimes you'll get lucky and find black. 123 Stitch will have everything you want. Literally everything you want, although they are just completely swamped right now because everyone's stuck at home and bored and they've got nothing to do so everyone went over to joanne or to one two three stitch and bought out their entire stock and uh every time i've tried to buy something from them it's been back ordered so i would recommend if you're just looking to get started and you're able to go to a store go to michael's walmart or just go to Amazon. They've got plenty of pre-cut pieces there as well. Amazon's probably safer right now. One, two, three stitch. Uh, they might be able to get you something, but they are so swamped. And then as for fabric types, there's a whole bunch. There are a whole bunch. The easiest one to get started on isn't even fabric. It is a plastic mesh. And I'm going to start screwing with my camera to show you guys these. So let's put it on autofocus and it doesn't autofocus very well there we go it's just a plain plastic mesh with the holes uh, punched in there at an even amount I've only ever seen it in 14 count I've heard some people say that it comes in 18 count and what that means is that is the number of stitches you can fit per inch so this one will have 14 stitches per inch uh, you'll also get what's called ADA. This particular one is 18 stitches per inch. Uh, it really does not want to focus. Okay, cool. We'll just do it manually. There we go. That works. So that is 18 stitches per inch. Uh, there's another one. It will go down to 11 is the more common one. And you can see how much chunkier that is. It's a lot bigger than the 18. And it will go... This is an Ada. This is what's called even weave. But typically your cross stitch fabric will go from about 11 stitches per inch to 32. And I think you can really start to see the difference. How much finer that is. Sorry, I'm right up on the microphone to do that. Uh, apologies for your ears. Ada is the more common one. It's the easier to use if you're starting. Even weave is kind of on the advanced side, I would say, because it's very easy when you're stitching for your stitches to slip. And when your stitches slip, that just means that they slide out of place and they don't uh, retain that classic X shape. They kind of uh, turn into something that just will fall completely out of the fabric if you do it wrong i've had that happen and it's very confusing but ada typically comes between 11 and 20 count i've seen some 22 count usually if it's 22 it's what's called hardanger and then around 24 it becomes even weave and those just define the shape of the weave ada uses four uh, strands of fiber per grid, grid square. Hardanger uses two, even weave uses one. So, Ada and the, what's called, it's called perforated plastic. I forgot to mention that. Those are the most common ones that you can get. There's so many other ones. Uh, there's different fabric types. Most Ada is cotton. You will find some polyester. You will find some linen. You will find some weird blends. I've even seen plastic Ada, which is like perforated plastic, but it's stamped to resemble Ada. The even weaves, they will be linen, they'll be Lugana, they'll be Monaco, which are just different cotton blends. Uh, one of them is like a weird, I forget what it is, it's like a tree fiber, uh, and it gives it a really shiny plasticky feel, but it also means that it's a little bit more durable to the elements. 
uh, which is why a lot of the even weave fabrics are kind of moving toward that. It's getting harder and harder to find straight up cotton even weave. But the fabric, pretty much the easiest part about it, you just go out, you figure out what would be the easiest one for you to see. Uh, most people tend to start at 14. You can start at 11. There's even something called monk's cloth, which tends to be between 7 and 10. But I don't really recommend it because it's not starched. You'll notice uh, this one. Uh, it's not super starched, but it will hold its shape. The 14 count, by contrast, is so stiff that it's just ridiculous. Uh, it's very, very starchy. And that can be easier to use for some people. I don't like the starch, personally. It really gets in my way. But it is easier to use, especially if you're not using a hoop. And that's the reason why you'll find a lot of the... A lot of the Ada will be really heavily starched. Uh, I was going to take a lot of questions at the end, but those two are very good. You can wash it before the project is, uh, before you start. Uh, but it really kind of depends. Sometimes if it's cheap, it will shrink. So you really want to make sure that it won't shrink on you. Um, and that can actually cause both a problem and it can be a boon depending on what you're looking for if you wash it afterward why did that icon not work for that emote uh because if you stitch and then you wash it and it shrinks that can actually improve your stitch coverage so some people will choose to wash it after to do that but yes you can wash it uh most questions i'll probably take at the end but that one was fairly relevant to right now so, where are we? So the next one that we want to talk about that we need, the, uh, the last need, is a needle. And one big mistake that everyone makes, every single person who has ever started cross stitch has made this mistake and bought embroidery needles. Do not buy embroidery needles. This is a type of embroidery. It's under the same Venn diagram as needlepoint, uh, cross stitch, other things that I can't think of at the moment because uh, surface embroidery, uh, thread painting, things like that, they're all embroidery. But you don't want embroidery needles unless you're doing surface embroidery or thread painting. What you want are blunt tapestry needles. And I've got a big jar of about 100 right here. And I will show you what they look like. I will show you what they look like. So let me pop you up here and I'm just gonna throw you way out of focus right to begin with and if I can find it there we go you can see that's not very sharp at all the tip is rounded and the reason the tip is rounded is because if you're using a super sharp needle you will go through the weave on your fabric if you saw earlier with the 18 and the 11 count, how it was like really chunky and the weave was, had a really good texture to it. Embroidery needles will go through that very easily and you don't want that to happen. Uh, so you want to use a rounded blunt tapestry needle because then it will guide itself through the holes that are naturally part of the weave. If you look very closely, it's hard to tell. I'll throw this up here again. Let me get it real close. You can see that there are just natural holes right in there. That's the 18 count. I had to like kiss it up to the camera to get that. You don't want to use embroidery needles because you'll go in between those holes. The most common tapestry needles that people use are between size 24 and I think size 28. I tend to use 26 and split the difference. The bigger the number is, the smaller your needle. So I right here have a 24 and a 26 and I will just show you the difference right here. Let me uh, bring that back up. My autofocus is not working today. It gets really bitchy sometimes. That's the difference. You can see 
that the 28 is quite a bit smaller than the 26. Uh, the 28s I use for when I'm beading. They're very good for beading. Beads will not go over a 26 needle. Most anyway, will not. Uh, so I keep the 28s around for beading and mostly just use the 26s, which is why I have a stupid amount of 26s. The, the brand of needle that you get otherwise really doesn't matter at all. Uh, just get yourself a needle, find the size that feels right in your fingers, and that's the one you want to use, basically. Uh, it really doesn't matter. You can get those pretty much anywhere, again, that will sell embroidery supplies. I don't think it's something that you can really find anywhere, though, that would just sell a needle, just because they are special for this type of stitching. Now, uh, let's talk about patterns for a second. And after we get through a little bit of this, we're actually going to start showing some demos. But for patterns, most people probably want one. Most people who are just starting out probably don't just want to YOLO wing it and try to figure it out as they're going. They want a pattern. And what patterns are, I didn't grab any. Uh, patterns are just kind of a, well, it's a pattern. It shows you how to do it. But it's kind of like a Rosetta Stone. So you'll get a grid of paper. Let me see if I can reach this one up here real quick. Ow. I throw my keyboard across the room. There we go. Apologies for that. So here's one that I've been kind of working on, but it will get the point across. I don't use paper patterns anymore, personally. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can avoid that as well. So the pattern itself will usually look like this. You will get a grid that has a bunch of random symbols on it and depending on the pattern maker and how they've chosen to do it, you may or may not be able to see the design within the grid itself. And then you will get something that looks like this, which takes all of those symbols and it shows you what they are in numbers. So this, these all say DLE and then a bunch of random numbers that is telling me that it's using dmc light effects and which numbers or which colors they are because if we grab one right here this particular shade of orange which is destroying the camera you can see how neon it is is number e 1020 and yeah this is uh dmc's neon you can tell how neon that is by how the camera just absolutely fails to know what to do with any of it. So that's how you read that. It's very simple. Most floss out there will follow its own numbering system. Uh, the CXC and the Royal Brodery do use DMC's numbers. Anchor will have its own unique numbers. Weeks Dye Works has its own numbers, Krynik has its own numbers, JNP has its own numbers, etc, etc. So whatever floss you're using, you want to make sure that your chart matches it. And a lot of uh, pattern sellers are able and are uh, willing to re-chart uh, your pattern for whatever floss you're using. Some, depending on the way that they put their patterns together, it's not as easy for them, so they may charge extra. You can get patterns from places. Etsy is really popular. Um, it's one of the biggest ones to get patterns from. The problems with Etsy are, one, it's Etsy. Uh, there's a lot of unfriendly practices that Etsy tends to engage in that's really starting to shy people away from it. And two, that's kind of where there's a lot of what's called pattern farms, which are people who don't necessarily have the rights to images. They don't even test the patterns to make sure they work. They'll just go grab a picture of a Disney princess, they'll run it through a converter, and then they'll slap the PDF up without knowing whether or not 
it will stitch well because what you see on your screen is not going to match the thread that you have in your hand and it's usually ends with having just a complete blob of wrong colors uh it's it gets really disappointing i've seen so many people spend money on patterns and then they were just completely unstitchable because of that so you have to be really careful when you're buying from etsy make sure that anywhere you're getting patterns make sure that it's been stitched or that the pattern seller has a good history of stitching their own patterns uh, another place that's just starting to take off there's a, uh, one other person at CouchCon who uh, has their patterns up here as well. I think they're patterns, they might be projects. Commissio is where I have all of my downloads because it's not Etsy, mainly. Uh, but that is a, it's an all-in-one kind of commission platform, but it does have digital downloads and people are starting to put their craft patterns up there. Deviant Art. I know it's not relevant at all in 2020, but somehow Deviant Art has an enormous supply of cross-stitch patterns. There's a really big cross-stitch community on DeviantArt. That's a really good place for it as well. You'll also find some Tumblr blogs. There are some folks that post them around Twitter, but those are the three places where it's easiest to search for them. I don't recommend Pinterest at all, uh, mainly because with Pinterest, you're not going to be able to get the PDF. You're going to get what is almost certainly a stolen JPEG, which means that the pattern that you're using probably costs money somewhere, but it was put on Pinterest and all you're seeing is the listing photo. And a lot of times people will just have their own weird Pinterest pattern farms. I don't know if there's a way that you monetize Pinterest. I don't know how it works, but for some reason, everything on Pinterest is stolen. So I tend to not like it as a source just because it's just so icky but etsy if you are comfortable using etsy i know a lot of people aren't these days commissio and deviantart right now are the best places to find patterns deviantart i know is still weird i thought it was weird five years ago when i discovered that You'll find free patterns on everywhere, all of those places, but maybe you don't want to do someone else's patterns. Maybe you want to do your own art. Maybe you want to de uh, design something and you can do that 100% free. You do not have to spend any money to make your own patterns. The people that typically have to spend money are the designers who need to put out a high volume of patterns and have complete control over what they look like. Those people they need to spend money. You do not. Uh, if you have MS Paint, there you go. You can make a pattern. Paint.net is the one that I recommend. That's not a website. That is the name of the program. And I hate that that's the name of the program. The website is getpaint.net. Uh, Paint.net, uh, it's called that because it uses the .net framework. That's what it was built on. Uh, it's like MS Paint, but it has layers. It has better font control. It has layer styles, so you have more control over what you're doing. I have done a tutorial, several, on how to use paint.net to uh, make a pattern. If you don't have Windows, if you're using Mac, Pinta is basically a paint.net clone. I've never used it, but people who have have told me that it's almost identical to paint.net. And they're both really good for making your pattern, getting everything put together. If you've just, if you're just using a few colors, you can just stitch right off of paint.net. If you want to use a little bit more, you've got something more involved. There's a web application called pick to pat and that's the number two pick to pat. I think it's .com, but you can Google it. And what that is, is it will take any image that you upload and it will give you a pattern version similar to the one that I showed you in this folder right here. And the thing that's really nice about pick to pat is it will give you a bunch of different uh, options for it. You do get options. So say that you are not comfortable 
with the 210 colors it spits out, it will say, well, here's an 80 color version, here's a 40 color version, here's a 20 color version. So it will give you levels of complexity that might be more comfortable for you. Pick to Pat is an entirely underrated piece of software. It's just a web application. You upload it, it's free, it's great, highly recommend it. Uh, it doesn't cost a penny to use. So between Paint, Paint.net, Pick to Pat, there you go. You're good. You don't have to spend anything. If you're uh, another common one, which does cost money, is grid paper. People will buy grid paper and just use colored pencils and make their patterns on that. Uh, if you're looking to spend money, there's KG Chart, which I don't recommend. Uh, I want to say that's around $40. I don't recommend it just on personal reasons. I don't like how the developer is very... There, there's an attitude that this is their software, so they don't need to take... Uh, they don't need to take suggestions. I Personally, I don't like that. Uh, and I don't like their chart key. There's a few things about it I don't like. It is there, and it's on the more affordable end. But uh, the ones that you'll see most people using are WinStitch and PC Stitch. And those are both about $60 each. Uh, and they are what, they are at this point kind of the quote unquote professional grade. Uh, most pattern makers are going to use one or the other. WinStitch is, also has a Mac version. I think PC Stitch does as well. I don't know, but they're very different. I've done tutorials on how to use both of them. And right now, I vastly prefer WinStitch. PC Stitch had a few features that I really like, um, but PC Stitch is also very anti-suggestion. They think that the way that they stitch is the only way that people stitch, and they've kind of ruined their software. Um, one big point against it is that it will not import white. If you import something with white stitches, it will import it blank. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons I quit using it. But it has really good text control. It has really good motif and special stitch control, which you really don't need if you're beginning. But they are out there. There are options. And if you're wanting to get away from paper patterns, uh, which I absolutely have, and the, uh, what was I saying? Just everything fell out of my head. Oh, if you want to get rid of paper patterns, I've still got a bunch hanging around because I just do. There are two options for that, depending on whether you're using Android or iOS. And unfortunately, they've both got pretty severe limitations. If you're using Android, there is a $10 app called Pattern Keeper, and that will allow you to upload PDF patterns. However, it will only allow you to upload PDF patterns from certain designers, which sounds really bonkers, but it's an in-progress app. And what they're doing is prioritizing known popular pattern makers over the individual Etsy seller because the known ones are going to be the biggest draw. So if you're getting your patterns from an Etsy store, it's not necessarily going to be usable on Pattern Keeper. X-Stitch Markup for iOS is free. Uh, the limitation with that is that the pattern maker has to use either WinStitch or PC Stitch, and they have to give you a specific file type. So if the pattern maker doesn't know that that's an option, you can't use their pattern because it won't upload the, or it won't import the PDFs. So they're both really nice ways to get away from having paper cluttering up your work area, but they've both got the same really big limitations. So it's kind of, it's, it's a little awkward. I use markup because I'm on iOS and I'm designing my own patterns. And it works for me. All of my patterns that I upload on Commissio, anything that you get from Patreon, will come with the markup file. I am not big and important enough yet for my patterns to be on Pattern Keeper, but as soon as they figure out how to let just any old person upload their PDF, I will let you know, because I would love to be able 
to have a completely paper-free environment for most people. That's awesome. That's why I quit using paper myself, because I realized I was printing 500 sheets of paper a month with all of the stitching I do, and screw that. So, <laughs> that is what you need to get started. And someone just said that, they, that they're here for the last 10 minutes. Um, we're an hour in, yes. I have this scheduled for about four hours, so you're good. You're, you're not going to miss a whole lot. It says it can, we tested it, it cannot. We tested that extensively about a month ago and we got about halfway through the process and then it failed. So it says it can. Um, I don't know what they were using to export their patterns because it wasn't anything that I was using. So that might have been, yeah, it was really bad. So, so we've talked about what you need Let's talk about how you'll actually get started. And this is where things are going to get really, really bonkers because at one point we're going to move to another camera and I'm going to show you some techniques. Before we get to that point though, oh, let me see, Crystal did send me a question. What did people mistake Ada for? Oh, I don't know. Like, I wasn't told, uh, I think this was in response to Joanne not carrying it by the yard. I don't know because it wasn't that in-depth of a question. But that was one of the things one of the managers told me was that they kept getting returns because it wasn't what people wanted. So I don't know anything that in-depth. I just know that that was one of the reasons that it wasn't, uh, that it wasn't carried by a lot of people. So... Let's go ahead and get into the second part of this. So we've we've talked about what you need to get started, where to get your floss, where to get your fabric, what kind of needles you need, what kind of patterns you need. Now let's actually look at how you'll get stitching. Um, and this is probably going to be the area that will cost you the most money up front is your mounting tool. Um, you can if you get the really heavily starched Ada, which most 14 and 18 count is. Uh, you don't necessarily need it if you're using one of those. So... Something in chat just totally distracted me. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. So, um, yeah, we've got... If you're using starched fabric, you won't necessarily need anything, any of these. That's what I'm talking about. So also, if you're just joining us, uh, so people don't think this is a regular stream, we're doing a panel on a beginner's guide to cross stitch. I'm not doing too much chat interaction right now today uh, because I've got a script that I'm trying to go through. But we are talking about how to get started with cross stitch on the dirt cheap because this is a hobby that you can spend a lot of money on. You, you can really, really spend a lot of money on. You can see our Kickstarter. We're at 1700 and that is going to just immediately disappear on everything that I need to buy for these kits. So it can be an incredibly expensive hobby, uh, but you can also do it really, really cheaply. So the first thing I want to talk about is how you mount your fabric. If you're using perforated plastic like this, you don't really need anything. This is designed to be stitched what's called in hand. If you're holding it in your hand without any mounting tools, you're stitching in hand and plastic is ideal for that. It's meant for that. Starched fabric, if your project is small enough, you can uh, do that too in hand fairly easily. I don't like to myself. So what you will need is some sort of mounting tool. And the most common you'll see are embroidery hoops. This is a four inch one. Uh, they will come between three and about 14 inches are the size that I've seen. I've also got some absolutely enormous ones that are for quilting that you can use for embroidery if you're an absolute psychopath. Uh, they're harder though because 
you can only reach so far with your arms. So at a certain point, you just get diminishing, diminishing returns. Uh, because if you can't reach it, what's the point of having it that big? So, uh, the wooden ones are probably the most common. You will also find them in plastic, and we'll be using this in a little bit. That's why I've got fabric on it. They're down on my floor with all of the fuzz. So the plastic ones, a lot of these, I don't know how well you can see that there is a little bit of a weird overlap there on the fabric. A lot of the plastic ones are locking, so the inner hoop will not pop out. If you pull your fabric really tight on a wooden hoop and it's cheap enough, the inner hoop will just pop right out. So plastic hoops get around that. They let you get super tight tension without popping out like that. You'll also find a variety of metal hoops. I didn't grab one. I know I have a few and I just forgot to grab one. Uh, there are a few varieties of metal hoops as well. Hoops are the most common ones to use. I don't like them and I tend to not recommend them though. Uh, they're great they're great for uh, cheap starter kits. Uh, the problem with hoops is one your hands. Your hands, you can wash your hands all your life. They're still your hands. They're still disgusting. They've got oil that comes out of the skin. You touch your hair when you're stitching and now you've got that on your hands. And as you're holding on to your stitching, that oil on your hand is going to get onto your fabric. And you'll see this a lot, uh, especially on really big detailed pieces. You'll get these, uh, nice yellow brown half circles that just dot the uh, project from where you were holding on with your hand it's really gross uh the you can use something called grind guards which will go around the uh out outside of the hoop and kind of protect it uh you can also wear gloves a lot of people don't like doing that but it's just kind of a big pain in the butt i also don't recommend them because the reason why the plastic hoops are so good, that locking mechanism, is because it ruins your fabric. It straight up ruins uh, and distorts the weave on your fabric. So if I'm stitching like this and I'm working on this for three or four hours and then I go to move it to work on a different area, that fabric right there along the edge is going to be permanently distorted and you're not going to have your perfect square grid. Uh, you'll get that a lot less with these, the ones that don't lock, but those ones also have the risk of just popping apart. The only time I ever use or recommend using hoops is when you know that the design that you're doing will fit fully inside the hoop and have good margins, and we'll talk about margins in a little bit as well. Otherwise, I really don't recommend them at all. Um, they cause more problems than they solve. They're just the traditional way of doing it, so of course they stick around. What I like hoops for is for framing. You can really nicely frame a piece in a hoop in a nice permanent method. There we go, that's what the back of that looks like. And you get that nice kind of traditional look with your hoop. Doing it that way, that's what I use hoops for. I don't hardly ever stitch in hoops unless it's extremely convenient to do so. Uh, the other one that I do recommend a little bit more, and let's see how much of this I can show, is what's called a Q-snap. And this is kind of a ridiculous piece. Don't mind that. And what these are is, let me pop it off is they are usually like some kind of a plastic or a PVC frame. And let me take my needle minder off. And they've got four clamps. And the problem with these is that they're expensive. This thing costs like $20. So there we go. So that's what the frame looks like. This is an 11 by 11 one. I don't know if you can see these little patches of green that is where it was so loose that it kept coming apart so i put tape on the inside just to make it a little bit bigger and stay together because these things are so freaking annoying when they don't stay together and then they've got these four clamps and they just 
clamp on really easily to your stitching. Uh, they will, however, they, they will be kind of mean to even weave fabric. They're a little bit nicer on Ada, so what most people will recommend doing, and you can see what it's done to this even, is take a piece of heavy felt and put it in between your stitching and the clamp. And you can kind of see there, uh, eh, losing everything. You can kind of see where the clamp was on top of the fabric and it like squished it down. It will do that to your stitching. So that's why you want to have something in between. So you would put your fabric down on your Q-snap and then you would put your felt down on top and then you just snap it over like that. I'm going to need to spend some time putting that back together so that I can just live over there. These come in a variety of sizes. I have a four inch one and then I have an 11 inch one. I kind of want to get one that's a little bit bigger. My problem with these is that they are not terribly modular. And I wish they were um, because I can't get the 11 inch one and then say, oh, well, I've got a four inch one, so let me just in in uh, increase that size because they don't have corner and edge pieces. Ah, the corner piece is the edge piece. I don't like that. That really irritates me quite a lot. So I wish that I could take the four inch one and the 11 inch one that I had and just kind of make it a little bit bigger, but I can't. Ow, there we go. And I kind of feel like that's by design to keep you having to buy more and more sizes of these damn things and spend 20 30 dollars each on them so those ones those ones are nice they're actually <laughs> despite being that uh that expensive they're probably your best bet because unless you're doing something small hoops are great if you're doing something bigger you probably want a cue snap if you're trying to do it on the cheap Otherwise, the other two that I'm going to show you, um, they're really good. And they're actually the ones that I prefer, but they're not as cheap, unfortunately. And the other one that we've got, whoops, is what's called a scroll frame. And it's called a scroll frame because, if I loosen that up a little bit, you will see that it scrolls along two rods on the stretcher bar, or on the extender bars. And that pretty much will let you tighten up your fabric to be able to work on it. These come in a variety of sizes. I think the smallest one I have is either 10 or 12 inches. Oops. And I've got a great big one. You can't quite see it behind me. I've got one that's 36 inches wide. Um, I don't recommend that one. That one's stupid. I've also got a big variety of the extender bars. I think the smallest one I have is six inches. And then I've got one that's two feet. I really don't uh, recommend the two foot one. That one's pointless because like I was saying with the giant hoops, these are only useful as far as you can reach. And I don't know about you, but when I've got something up on my chest, I can't reach to work on something comfortably two feet ahead of me. My comfortable reach tends to max out at around 10 inches, which doesn't seem like a lot. It really doesn't. But what you have to kind of keep in mind is that, yeah, you can reach farther, but do you really want to be holding your arms out perfectly straight with no nothing to rest on for several hours while you're working? So, ugh, no, don't do that. I don't recommend that at all. That's disgusting. Uh, the other one that we have, which I was looking at right here, are stretcher bars. And that's what these are right here, what my intensely neon guy is. Uh, let's see, I don't know if Crystal's to here. I see your comment. I'm going to save it for later so that I don't lose my train of thought again. So these are stretcher bars. And what they are, you can kind of see that they these are a little bit more modular than the scroll frame, or than the, um, the, uh, okay. The Q-snap, there we go. And these, I wrote on there, this is seven and nine inch. 
and they just kind of slot together and whatever sizes you want these come between 6 and 18 and the 18 inch ones are really good for when you want something wide uh, it is impossible to use them on something 18 inches tall and these are a lot like the hoops in that the size that your stretch or that your stretcher bars are that is the maximum size that you are allowed to go because i don't know if you can see what those are the fabric is tacked down a lot of people when they see me using these they think they're magnets they're not those are actually tacks and they're tacked into the wood so you're going to damage your fabric your stretcher bars i love these these are my favorite method to use but they will damage the hell out of your fabric so you really want to make sure that where you're stitching doesn't come close to where your tacks are and that's why i was going to also talk about margins and measuring your fabric so this piece right here is on a seven by nine inch uh frame which it didn't even need to be that big i probably could have could have got away with seven by seven but i didn't want to film on a square because I, I was filming this piece so generally i recommend about three inches of margin uh, on any piece that you're doing this one was a little bit smaller because i didn't want to waste a lot of fabric but between two and three inches is what i recommend for your margin just to make sure that you can frame your piece that you can finish it do whatever you need to do with it and that margin i've seen people uh, in the Discord, on Twitter, on everywhere, who will stitch right up to the end of their fabric. And another reason you don't want to do that, I don't know if you can see that, look at how frayed up and disgusting that edge is. Now, if you're stitching within three or four stitches of the edge, well, what's going to happen when your fabric just completely falls apart, which it will. Now, uh, you can probably see here as well that I have pinked the edges, which means that I have taken these big scary scissors um, that a lot of teachers tend to use for scrapbooking, I've, I've uh, noticed. They're called pinking shears. And what they do is they intentionally screw up the edge of your fabric so that when you kind of start to fray, some of the strands will come off but then this one will not. It will only fray to a certain point because the weave has become uneven and distorted. Like, <coughs> right here. That is never coming off because there's too much on top of it. And it's kind of tied itself into a very convenient knot. So those scissors will help you keep them from fraying. You'll also pe see people serge or tape their edges. All acceptable all acceptable but that's why you want really big margins so that you can do whatever you need to do to your edges and still be able to frame now earlier we were talking about counts about how we have 11 18 28 all these different counts of fabric we were talking about that so how you would measure your fabric and this tends to blow people's mind it's exactly like digital image resolution exactly if you are working on a digital image that is 300 dpi that means that you have 300 pixels per inch which is print resolution so when you've got something that is 28 count you have 28 stitches per inch so you know that if your image is going to be 12 inches wide you need to figure out that okay i have got 12 inches of fabric and my calculator is taking forever to load i should have preloaded it where it is so we've got 28 inches of that or we've got 28 count so 28 stitches per inch and we have 12 inches so that's 30 336 stitches that we're going to be doing so you can uh, get there the other way so you take 336 stitches and you divide that either by the count or by the size you want it so say this piece is 336 stitches across and i want it to be 12 inches wide what count would i put that on so you divide that by 12 and you get 28 count so it's all just very basic kind of mathematical formula so when you figure out what your dpi is 
effectively is what your count is, then you know how much count or how much fabric to cut. So say, okay, well, I've got this 28 count fabric and I know that it's 336 stitches wide. How many inches is it going to be? So we take, you know, that 336 and we divide that by 28 and we get 12. So that tells you, okay, well, we've got 12 inches of design. Then you want to add three on one side and three on the other side. So that's, what is that, 12, 15, 18 inches wide is what you want it to be. And then you do that again for your height. It's, it's one of those things that really tends to trip people up, and I don't know why. It's just very basic math. Uh, and it's something that we wind up coming across in the Discord fairly frequently is that someone just gets really tripped up. Uh, and then something that will tend to trip people up as well is that cross-stitch fabric is always measured in inches. Uh, every now and then you'll see it measured in metric, which is really annoying because most of the world uses metric. So you have to also be able to do that mental conversion of centimeters to inches. And that, unfortunately, gets a little bit more difficult. It's not something I have to do super often. But generally, when you're measuring your fabric, you need to know two of three things. Either what the count is, how big you want it in inches or centimeters, or how big, how many stitches your fat or your your design is. There we go. I got there in the end. Words are falling out of my brain. Now, if you're doing something that is going to be a massive, massive, massive amount of stitches, you'll probably want to grid your fabric. And you might have noticed that I did that on this one. That there is some... Where we go? There we go. There's some blue that I've drawn on that fabric right there. And it's hard to get that around my microphone with and still being able to see that I'm on frame. There's a few different ways that you can do that. This is totally optional. And oh boy, does this cause drama on the internet, and I don't know why, but internet people are stupid. Uh, there's two ways that you can do it. You can do it with a pen, and you will find some special made pens. These are the ones that I use. Uh, they come from Japan, they're really nice. Basically, you draw on your fabric and just a little bit of water and it's gone. Um, I don't know if you can still see it, kind of, maybe. Uh, some water actually got dripped on that, and there's this big blank hole in my grid. Now, if you don't feel like buying the really nice pens from Japan, I can't blame you. Uh, you will find some that are, like, just no-name brands in craft stores. And they're decent. They do tend to kind of um, dry out very quickly, though. Like, the, the, ja the Japanese ones that I use, the Leonis ones, they're great. I love those. Another one you can use, and this blew my mind when I learned it, Crayola Ultra Washable Markers. They have to be ultra washable, not just the regular washable ones. If they are ultra washable, they will work. Crayola has accidentally invented an embroidery pen that comes in multiple colors, because when you get these ones right here, there's a secret code that people don't realize. Uh, there are the blue ones, which are water erasable, purple ones dissolve in the air, and then there's green, which does something, and I can't, I think those ones are heat. I think. Um, and if you apply heat to a blue one, it will stain and turn yellow, and you'll never get it off. So, what the uh, pens, super great resource, super confusing to new people. One, uh, two things you never want to use. Never use a pencil. Never, ever, ever use a pencil because the graphite is just stacked carbon and it will break down to the molecular level and get stuck inside the fibers of your fabric and never, ever come out. And don't use ballpoint pens because it's not designed to be washable. If you're using a friction pen, which I have seen some folks, I don't even have one over here. I bought a bunch recently. Yes, I do. No, I don't. That's a marker. I bought a bunch recently to do a test on it. And you'll see a lot of people who tout friction pens saying, yeah, you know, because they erase with heat, I just have to iron it. Um, yeah, once you iron it, if your project gets cold again, the ink comes back and then it will not go away. You can't re-iron it. And if you live somewhere 
where it gets cold <laughs> and say you're out of the house for a weekend and you don't have your heater on and it gets cold in your house it will come back and then your project is ruined so don't use friction pens for the love of everything that is holy the other way you can do it is with a some sort of a filament this is silky sliver which i had seen it for years as silky silver and couldn't figure out why i couldn't find it but this is just I think it's meant to be a blending filament, but it works really well for gridding because it's just this really nice, very sheer, fine plastic line, basically, is what it is. Um, I know, super not great for the environment, but it means that you can't accidentally stitch through it. If you try to do your gridding with floss or thread, you will stitch through it and you will cry. Uh, there's someone, David, in the Discord who has gridded with thread and he's just kind of cutting the thread away as he gets to it. That's another way you can do it. Um, but typically, I've been using a lot of this and I will use here are you, these. There are special white embroidery pens or pencils you can use as well. Uh, you can see I have used that on this. My freaking cameras backwards from how I like it. If you're using the white embroidery pencils that are designed for that, those are fine. You just don't want to use graphite pencils. You want to use special white pencils. Um, and unfortunately, the white pencils are the only way <laughs> that you can grid on dark fabric because while that fabric, that is some sort of a synthetic fiber, so that black will never ever bleed. If you're using something like this, this has been hand dyed and it's very lovely. As soon as you wash this fabric, all of that red is going to come out and ruin your stitching. So gridding on something that has been dyed is a freaking nightmare. So this is kind of the best way to do it. Um, and it has kind of helped me do a few more things on color that I like to do because I do really like using colored fabric. White is very boring, especially if it's not going to be full coverage, which that just means edge to edge coverage. Um, whereas something like this would be considered partial coverage where it doesn't cover the edge to edge. And there's a reason why I did that one on white, so that's fine. So if you want to grid, which I highly recommend it, and don't let any of the Facebook biddies tell you that gridding is wrong, because ultimately you're doing this for enjoyment, and how can it be wrong if you're enjoying yourself and making it easier for yourself, and I don't understand the argument that you can be doing any craft wrong. I don't freaking know. Um, <laughs> I don't like the Facebook biddies. And then one other thing I want to talk about before we switch over to the, sta uh, to the stand and I start showing you some other things is this is surprisingly something that I see a lot and that is following the pattern. So I have a theory about this. I have a theory and it's about the way arts and crafts are taught in school because I think at this point we have all, we all remember having, you know, that craft lesson where the teacher went through and showed you exactly how to do the thing. You had to cut out the paper in a certain way. You had to color it in a certain way. And there wasn't a lot of room to make it your own. If you, I experienced this several times growing up, where if I wanted to add my own elements, it was wrong and I wasn't allowed to do that. And I think a lot of these issues kind of come from that, where people are trained out of creativity. And one of the weirdest trends I see in this hobby are people afraid about not following the pattern. Um, and you'll see this too, where people will post a finished thing that they made and say, oh, there's so many mistakes that no one will ever notice. And I do genuinely believe it comes down to people having a very rigid idea of how crafts are taught. So I just want to put, put this out there. If you get a pattern and you get it from Etsy or you, you get it from wherever, you get it from a name brand, 
It doesn't matter if you decide that I don't like the way this looks. I'm going to change this. Or, oh no, I screwed this up. Now I'm going to just kind of, instead of frogging everything, which just means tearing everything out, instead of doing that, I'm just going to kind of YOLO my way back to there. Um, Crystal's got a great experience with that, with a witch that she's doing. She screwed up the arm and she didn't want to frog everything, so she just kind of tried to YOLO her way back and eventually got there. But if you make a mistake on your pattern or you don't like your pattern or anything like that, you just want to change the color, that's allowed. Just because the pattern maker has said that these are the colors you should use and you should use these specific colors in this way, it's a suggestion. It's always meant as a guide. Uh, that's why I actually don't put a lot of instructions on my patterns because I have noticed that the more instructions you put on there, the more people will tend to uh, second guess themselves. So if you get a pattern and you don't have the colors that it lists or you don't like the colors that you list, change them. You're allowed to do that. Um, there are so many things that I had these weird epiphanies about as I was starting out and really learning that it, it occurred to me, I'm allowed to do this. I found this way that makes it easier and I'm allowed to do this. Like there's this really weird mental block that's very common where you just don't even consider experimenting because it doesn't feel like you're allowed to do it. It's really bizarre and I can't even fully explain it. And one of the things that I discovered that you're quote unquote allowed to do is a genuine proper technique. And I'll actually show you this uh, in a little bit, but it was just one of those really weird things. And, and then another thing that I'm going to show you literally came to me in my sleep. So we're going to switch gears real quick. I'm going to switch over to this camera and oh, that was a very harsh transition. Okay. <laughs> And I am going to put some stuff on my stand and we are going to get into some actual technique for you guys. Yeah, and it's one of those things where uh, experienced stitchers also will have like this really weird attitude. Well, of course you're allowed to do that. Geez, I do that all the time, which, you know, valid also, but it's also one of the things that I really do try to foster um, within this community, especially, is that mm, nobody is born an expert. Nobody is born an expert. Nobody knows what they're doing right out of the bat. Uh, so that's why we're really working on putting together this glossary. Uh, that's why I have 800,000 tutorials up on my YouTube. That's why I'm actually this uh, starting next month. I'm going to start redoing every single one of my tutorials, every single one I'm redoing to show a different way from the way I did before. Because another problem that you will get within the craft community is that this is the way that I do it and it's the only valid way to do it. And oh boy, is that stupidly detrimental as well. Um, hi, I'm screwing up my camera, don't mind me. Oh, wrong way. So I kind of try to, as much as possible, make sure that people know that the way that I am showing you is the way that I prefer to do it right now at this moment. And there have been so many times where I have done a tutorial and then changed my way or changed my mind on the way that I like to do it. Hi, we're, uh, <laughs> we're just getting everything kind of changed up. If you're just joining us, we are doing a panel on getting into embroidery cross stitch specifically my cord is all over the place and not where i want it to be there we go i think we have a question uh what's the best kind of fabric to use on a scroll frame that one came up a little bit ago anything you want and there are multiple different types of scroll frames i prefer the velcro ones there's also the based method which is nice um, the one that you don't want are the split rods, where... I wish I had a smaller one over here. 
I'll show you this real quick. I know it's kind of dark all of a sudden. So if I unscroll this, you can see that there's some Velcro there. And if I lift that up, my fabric is just attached with Velcro. And the Velcro is just glued to the fabric. And then when I'm done, I'll cut off the uh, strip where the fabric is. These are my personal favorites. I'm not going to say they're the best ones, but these are my personal favorites because they're very forgiving. You can move things around and you can change it very easily if you don't like the way that you put it on there. That's why I like them. Uh, the based method is where the rod will have a piece of muslin permanently attached. And then you will just stitch your fabric directly onto that. Those ones are really nice as well. They're a little less forgiving, but they will keep tension like you wouldn't believe. The ones that are objectively trash, and I've never heard a single thing, good thing about them, are the ones that you can get at Michael's. The rod is split down the middle. You're meant to sandwich the fabric through the split in the rod, and then sandwich the rod through the extender bars. And basically what always winds up happening is that the rod is too small for the extender bars, and you won't get any tension. As soon as you stitch, everything comes apart. Uh, they're trash. <laughs> And I've had so many comments from people saying that they bought one and they thought they were doing something wrong when it just turned out that the tool they were using is garbage. So those are the only ones I don't recommend. Uh, but anything with Velcro or anything with a base strip, they're freaking awesome. The problem is they're expensive. They are really expensive. Um, I don't even know how much money I've spent on my various ones. You can get them on Amazon. The brand that I use specifically is American Dream. Although they may or may not have been discontinued. I don't know. I've heard conflicting reports. Um, as for the best fabric in general, it depends on what you're doing. I prefer even weave because even weave, I can get really intense detail into a really small uh, section. Ada is easier to learn on. Ada has a more defined grid and is just overall a little bit nicer. Oh my God. <laughs> I apologize for your eyes. Let's fix that. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, the ones at Michael's are crap. I don't have any experience with any other ones, but yeah. Yeah, like the muslin strips, you need us. You basically need an upholstery or darning needle for it. So we're gonna. Uh... I'm gonna get you guys set up so that you can see what we're doing. Don't mind me. Uh, try not to give everyone a seizure while we're at it. Okay. There we go. I used to do this where the camera was over my head, and that was awful. Yeah, I really like the American Dream ones, because they're really nice and sturdy, and they're a good mid-range price. Those are the ones that I do tend to recommend. Uh, let's just find a good place for this. Okay. So, I think... We'll zoom in a little bit. I really want you guys to be able to see what I am doing. I was going to use this camera for the entire uh, first half of the uh, for the stream, but that camera is such garbage that I decided, screw it, we'll just take 10 minutes in the middle to reset everything. <laughs> so I think that's about as good as we're getting this. Okay. Okay. So, um, let's just use whatever I've got garbage over here. Why not? We can use JNP. JNP is fine. Nice, light orange. We don't care if the color's not matching. We just want you guys to be able to see it. So, the first thing we're going to do is how do you get your floss off of this skein? Uh, this is the most confusing thing for so many new stitchers. So eventually you will find an end on there. And... Most skeins, if they are of good quality, you can just pull it right on out. 
Now, the amount that you use, that you pull off, is going to be very dependent on what you're comfortable. For a brand new stitcher who has never done this before, I recommend taking the end of the floss, pinching it in your finger, and then pulling out one length arm to arm and cutting it where your other fingers are. I'm going to do two because that is more comfortable for me. So I always do two. I get laughed at a lot. People think I'm crazy, but that is what's more comfortable for me. Another common one, if you're just getting started, is to go from fingertip to sternum or fingertip to opposite shoulder. Those are also really common measurements as well. But for me, two spans of the arm is really nice. It's very comfortable length to work with. So now we've got our floss right here and I'm just gonna beat it up a little bit. And now we can see that it's six strands of floss, not actually one. So when you get your fat or when you get your pattern, a lot of them will say to use one strand, use two. Some of them will say to use three or four. What that means is to beat up the edge and pull that one strand off because each length of thread is actually six strands very loosely wound together. And what I've seen people do, oh, we've got a Kickstarter campaign. That's not what I wanted. Oh, well, um, go away. What we've got over here is one whole strand. And I've seen people who didn't understand that, saw that they were supposed to use two strands and use two solid lengths like that and then couldn't figure out why nothing worked. Um, that's why. And it's one of those things that you don't see a lot in beginner tutorials because it's kind of assumed as basic knowledge. And that is one of those things that tends to happen a lot in this hobby especially is that people assume that basic knowledge is something that people are just born with. I guess. I don't know. Also, I never actually fixed the title on this. Oh well, totally forgot. We're not creating curler designs. I'm gonna... Gee, I just noticed that. We've been going an hour and a half. Uh, there we go. Whoops. Let people know what we're actually doing. <laughs> Nobody told me. I was so frazzled getting everything else set up. So we've got our one strand. Now you can use one single strand and I am actually going to cut off a bit because we're going to be doing a whole bunch of different things. So for now I'm going to use a half length and I'm going to put that aside because I want to show you guys some stuff. So if you're using one strand, uh, I don't want a needle that's full of tarnish, that's gross. If you're using one strand, there are a few different ways you can do this. So you would just thread your needle and there you go. That's all we're doing right there. No more than that because that is all we are going to be stitching with. Uh, if you're using two strands, which is probably going to be the more common and the more comfortable way to do anything. There are a few ways you can do it, and it really depends on what kind of fabric you're working with and what kind of floss you're working with. Now, some people will do it this way, and then they'll come over here, and they'll put the two together, and they'll pull the needle all the way over to the end. So we've got our needle over here on the inside of the loop. And I think this is how a lot of people start off doing it initially, because then you can come over here and you can tie yourself a knot on the thread just like this and there you go now your thread is going to stay securely in place and the basic way that people will do it and this is perfectly valid if you don't really care how it's going to look framed perfectly valid is you'll just pop your needle up from the beginning let's go up a little bit higher i think and you'll just pull your needle up through here 
and now that knot on the back is going to keep it from ever coming through. Uh, the problem with this is now there's a knot on the back. If you're framing this in a hoop, it doesn't matter. If you're framing this uh, by canvas stretching or similar, it doesn't matter. Where it does matter is if you're going to be matte framing this, meaning putting it in a traditional frame, that knot, when it's up against the back of the frame, is going to cause bumps in your project. And you don't want that, probably. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe you do. Who am I to say? So what you can do, if you want to do it this way, which is a really good way to get used to using your needle, because your needle will not slide off. There is nowhere that your needle is going. It is just there forever, and you're going to have to cut it off. You can't lose your needle. Your needle won't slide off. It's a very nice, easy way to learn. So instead of putting your knot on the back, we're going to put the knot on the front, and this is called a waist knot. So we're going to put our needle like right here. Right there works. And now that big old knot is on the front, and you're probably thinking, well, that's gross. Now I've got a big knot on my front, but that's fine. So we've come from that line right there. We're gonna go about an inch over. We're gonna go right there. And now when we stitch, we're going to go in the direction of that knot. And you can kind of, I think maybe, if I pull that tight, you can just about see where the floss is underneath. We wanna make sure to come down. So here's the needle up here. So we want to make sure to come down and catch that floss. And we don't have to do that every time. You just kind of want to do it for the first few stitches to make sure it catches. So we're going to go ahead and just stitch over that a few times. We're not even going to go all the way to the end. I'm just doing some very quick, very sloppy stitches. Because what we are doing is that thread that's going from the knot to that first stitch. We're now burying it with every single stitch that we do. So here we go. We're just kind of blop, blop, blop. And we do that all the way across. I'm not going to. Because then once you've done that, you just take your scissors. You want to get some nice delicate ones. Uh, if you're using some great big ones, which I have over here and I don't know what that was. Um, I don't know where my big old chonker scissors are, but you want some nice little delicate ones and you're just going to grab that, pull it up, and snip. And that stitch right here, with enough stitching over it, that's not coming out. That stitch is solid. That one's just there. And it ain't coming out. So we're going to do all of our stitching. And there are two ways you can end off your floss. One of them, if this were the back, I don't feel like switching everything over. So pretend for a moment that this is the back. You would just slide your needle underneath, pull it through. So ugh. you would pull it through until it caught tight and then you would snip it right there. Or another way you can do it, and let's see if I can pull this out. There we go. This is my preferred way of doing it, is to just take your needle and again, near where your waist knot was, pull it through, give it a nice snip, about an inch or two, let that hang off right there, and just leave it. Because as we continue to stitch more, the same thing that happened with the waist knot will continue to happen, and when we go on to the next color, we will be stitching over all of that. I need to take my glasses off because my allergies are not liking me and I can see better up close without them anyway. So we can see kind of right here where that thread is underneath, I think. As we stitch, it will just get buried and then you can go through when you're done and you would cut it right here. So I'm just gonna pretend that we did that. I don't care if this stitching comes out because it doesn't matter. So that's one way you can start and stop your thread with your two strands. Another way is called the loop start. And this is magic. The loop start is 100% magic. And my face, where's all my stuff? I don't know where all of my stuff is. Maybe that's what fell. There it is. So the loop start is 
pretty magic. And this was one that um, kind of blew up on my channel a little bit. So we're going to do this the opposite way. Is we're going to take both both threads right there and we're gonna, we're gonna put them together so that the loop is over here away from the needle so we've got our needle and we're putting both threads through there we go and we're just gonna like before at the very beginning we've just got this little bit that's all we need the loop is over here on this end so we're going to come up from the top of the fabric and go down and leave about an inch so that the loop is there. Come up from down below diagonally. And now that loop, when we go through that loop right there, I don't know if you saw that, so I'm gonna do that again. So when we come up, we're just gonna put the needle through the loop, just like that, catch the needle on there and zoop. Now, the whole thing is kind of gripped onto the fabric. That's not going anywhere. And we just go down through the same one. And there we go. Just like that. And we'll stitch over. And that is never coming out. Um, which is amazing about 99% of the time. What isn't amazing is when you've done this and you realize you've screwed up and you have to remove everything uh sometimes you'll be able to go through and unstitch everything so oh no i screwed up over here i'm gonna unstitch this and if you're very careful you can come through and you can unstitch everything and then when we get to the end we go like this we've unstitched the whole thing and we can reuse that thread if we need to. Um, unstitching the loop start is something I still struggle with. It's so hard because it's designed to be permanent. So oftentimes if you're doing a loop start and you've completely screwed up, uh, you might just have to full on frog it, which means grabbing a seam ripper and a pair of scissors and going to town. And my and allergies hang on one second here there we go my allergies are kicking off they always do around the two hour mark my allergies always get really bad i even took pills and everything i think it's because i've got fans blowing on my face maybe if i turn those off and then just cry so one thing though this is what really kicked off my this is what really kicked off on my channel because someone asked me if there was a way to do a loop start with one strand. Thank you very much. And the answer is yes. And then I'll throw, show you how to do it with three as well because I knew how to do it with two. I knew how to do it with three and four and everything else. And excuse me one moment. But doing it with one, that was tricky. So, let's see if I can actually unstitch this. Let's see if it will let me, and I'll show you what I mean by how hard this is. So we, we get in here and we pull and we pull and we pull and we pull. There we go. So you pretty much have to undo that whole thing and it's really tricky. There we go. So what we want to do for that one stranded loop start, which is really bonkers. And this is, this literally came to me in a dream. Uh, I had gone to bed and I woke up and turned on the light and I grabbed one of my embroidery pieces that was on the bed next to me. And my husband said, what in the fuck are you doing? And I said, shut up basically. So I figured this out after someone asked me, if this would work and I I said I don't know and it didn't get out of my brain for a long time so if you're using one strand uh, you're not going to be doing this on 14 count this would be for something if you're on like 28 count or 32 where it won't matter 
that you're actually at one point using two strands. So we're going to come up from the back. Where do I want to be? Right here. That works. So I'm going to come up from the back and not come all the way. Now I didn't have a knot on the back or anything. We just got it here and I'm going to hold on to the end. You can't see that. And I'm going to leave about two inches on the back so I have something to hold on to. And then I'm going to go back down through the same hole. This is really tricky. This is kind of advanced, but I get a lot of questions about it. So I'm still holding on to what's on the back. And then I'm going to come up through here. And then there we have our loop right there. Then I'm going to hold on to the back, come up from the front or come up from the back there opposite, just like we were doing our previous loop. It's kind of a two handed ordeal. And then I'm just going to pull that through. Make sure I have the other side where to go. I've lost it. There it is. So I'm going to pull that through right there. If I can find it, it's up here. Maybe. I don't know. There it goes. Either way, I do this though. If I pull it that way or pull it that way, basically we're kind of doing a sewing machine stitch. So we've got that bit looped around right here. We're going to go back down through the same one right here. So either way, no matter which one we pull, there's going to be two strands right here. You can kind of tell, I think, that there's two strands. And then we'll come up and we'll do the other side. And I've tied a knot into my fabric. That's fine. I don't care. They're into my floss. And when we do the second half, that's going to just tack that down and we're not going to need to worry about that and that there is how you would do a loop start without any knots on your really delicate even weave fabric apologies my allergies get way out of control in here it's all the lost fibers in the air that kicks up when i start working with stuff so i'm just uh Ugh, trying to get that to stop. Now, since I've just made a big old mess of that and I can feel an enormous knot, I'm just going to cut that off. Now, what if it calls for three strands? What if it calls for three strands? So, uh, I think I'm going to get the piece that's slightly larger. We've got our thread right here. And you want to hold on one end and one finger the other end and the other finger. And this is kind of a weird, a weird process. So you're gonna grab onto it with one pinky and then the other so that when you pull it tight, it makes kind of a Z shape. Can you see that? I think you can see that there's now three strands. So we're going to come over here and I'll show you what the ends look like. We have one loop and a little tail. And then on the other end, we have a loop and a tail and you kind of want to make sure that you've always got the tail a little bit longer than the loop which can be kind of tricky you can do that one of two ways you can just try to finagle it there or since we have to cut it anyway we'll just cut it so that these ones are all the same because that's the side we're going to thread so now we have three strands through our needle and on the other end we've got a loop and a tail that's just a little bit longer. And we're gonna do the same thing now. At this point, we just come on through, do our loop. And down we go. And you can do that from the other side if you're worried about that tail, or you can just kind of force it through. Doesn't matter either way but there you go is how you would do a loop start with three or more strands and obviously if you use if you're using an even number like four you would just double up your floss probably should have gone through the back but there we go got there in the end and then you just stitch over it and now you're stitching with three strands so that those are a few different ways that you can start 
And starting is always, I think, one of the things that gets people really caught up because they hear, don't ever use knots. And I actually had someone who had heard, don't ever use knots and took it to the extreme conclusion by trying to logic at me that don't ever use knots also includes waist knots, which don't even stick around and get cut away. So it's kind of one of those things that you'll see with art where people learn don't trace. And then they think that somehow rotoscoping or tracing over something just to learn the form, somehow that's bad as well because they don't really understand the full scope of what's going on. So there we go. That is getting started. A lot of different ways to get started. I tend to prefer the loop start. More often than not, I'm stitching with two strands. Uh, when I use a waist knot, I'm usually using metallic thread because I will typically blend metallic with cotton. So I'll use one strand of metallic, one strand of cotton, which means I have to tie the uh, threads together and then I will use a waist knot. So for the most part, that's what I use. I don't tend to use waist knots too often, but I am going to get rid of our mess over here. There we go. And I am going to grab a new thread. Ugh, maybe, I'm just gonna cut that off. I don't know why I'm not using a needle minder either. And I'm going to show you another thing that tends to trip up a lot of new people. Uh, in the trash you go. There we go. So you'll hear people talk about stitching in the same direction. Make sure you're always stitching in the same direction. Well, what the hell does that mean? Um, and the problem is it means different things depending on the context. And it's one of those things like how when you're speaking, you don't necessarily notice that there are rules within speech. And this is one of those things where people who are experienced won't necessarily notice that they're talking about something that can be taken wildly out of context. So we're going to look at all three contexts for stitching in the same direction. And I think the one that most people mean is going to be the first one we look at. So when we are talking about stitching in the same direction, we're going to go ahead and get started. And let's move out of that area that I screwed up, get a nice fresh area of fabric. Where are we? We are right here. I'm gonna go up a little bit higher, I think. Right about here. So we're going to very quickly get started here. So now here is the first leg of our stitch. We're going from the top left to the bottom right. And then the second leg of our stitch is going from the top right to the bottom left. Now the direction you do your first stitch in does not matter. It doesn't matter if you like to do it to where your bottom half goes that way and your top half goes that way. Fine, do it that way, that's cool. What does matter is that every single other stitch you do goes the same way. So we are going to go Come here, you. From the top left to the bottom right, and then from the top right to the bottom left. Now, one thing I do find is very helpful is to always stitch down into whatever you've already done. So doing it this way means that we're stitching up from it. So what I might want to do is actually switch this up and go from the top left or from the top, from the bottom right to the top left. There we go. And always stitch down. And the reason you want to do this is because it makes sure that you're not pulling anything up from the back of your fabric because there could be like little loose threads or some fluff or something. And when you're pulling that up from here, it's a lot easier to deal with it than if you're pulling it up from right here. 
because if you pull it up from right here, you might wind up damaging the stitch that you've already done and that's bad. So you kind of always want to try to stitch down into what you've already done. Now, that is one, you know, method, meaning of always stitching in the same direction. And it tends to be what people mean. I apologize. My allergies have got out of control today. Ugh. So that's, that's one thing that people tend to mean. Now, I think this is also another thing that gets really confusing for people because you'll notice that I am stitching a full stitch at a time. That is one way of doing it. Another way people will do it, I'm not going to bother continuing to start and end my stitches at, or my floss at this point. Another way people will do it is to go do a line of bottom stitches. And then you'll come back when you're done with your bottom stitches. And you'll go back on and do your top. So there we go. And that can be an easier way of always stitching in the same direction that way because it's harder to forget what you've done. I don't tend to do it this way though uh, because the patterns that I do don't tend to lend well to it. Uh, this is not the best way to stitch if you're doing something that has a lot of what's called confetti. If it's got confetti in it, that means that you've got, here's a stitch of this orange, and then there's one over here, and one over here, and they're just kind of everywhere. Um, most of what I stitch has that. Lately, these little ones, the little basic beginner ones, they don't have that because they're, they're beginner pieces. Um, I don't think I have anything on hand. Uh, maybe my goat does. But if you're stitching like that, you want to be doing each stitch at a time. Otherwise, you're going to be dragging a lot more thread around the back than is necessary. Uh, so you generally always want to pull as little thread on the back as possible, which also means not necessarily going from over here all the way to over here. You might want to cut your thread and then just go back over there later. It just depends, though, on the way that you want to stitch. So stitching in one direction means always keeping the top half of your stitch going the same direction every single time. It also means and this is what, what people get hung up on, keeping your stitching in the same direction. So we, we've got this going over here. Now we are going this way. So we're going to come back down here and we're going to stitch going in that way. And I'm gonna go back to doing it this way because this is the way that's more comfortable for me. And I think this is what really gets people hung up when they get to variegated floss. And you'll notice now I have slightly changed up a little bit again, and I will do that, because uh, I always tend to stitch down into where there's more stitching. So right now there's no way to not stitch up. So we'll just stitch up from where there's the least amount of stitching. And then we'll go down to where there's more stitching. So we're gonna do this right here. And now this is where people will get kind of hung up because they'll hear that you should always stitch in the same direction. Well, does that mean going all the way back over to here? Right over here. No, no, it doesn't. You would actually come down to this one and you'd go backwards. And that gets people hung up a lot. So we're going to go ahead and go here. Eek. Uh, and where that really gets people hung up are people who do it the other way, where they do the line of bottom halves and then they do the line of top halves and then they go on to variegated floss because variegated floss, you generally want to do the full stitch at a time and people who aren't used to that will get really confused. And I'll show you a bunch of different ways to use that. It's a lot of fun. I need to turn this one off too. Okay. My apologies. My face is not happy right now. I've already taken allergy pills, so there's not a lot I can do about it. Spray down my face, I guess. Wash it off. Mm. 
people who are at these streams, they're used to this. This happens every single time. I get floss up in my nose or in my eye, and then my allergies go berserk. Okay. So. <sighs> so we've got this right here. And another thing that you might notice, this wasn't on my list, but it's something that I see a lot of people and get really disheartened about so if you see here as i'm stitching i've got these two strands you can see the white through it you can definitely see that white fabric through the orange there's little little specks of it i'm zoomed in and when you're when you are working on something you are effectively working zoomed in because you're going to be you're going to have your stitching about six inches from your face when i zoom out suddenly it's not as noticeable and if i were to zoom out even more you wouldn't see it at all so if you have little white bits in your stitching because you can see the fabric don't worry about it that's fine that's allowed and i'll even show you how to avoid that a little bit more i'm kind of just doing this as quickly as possible to get through it all but there are ways to help avoid that but if you see white in your stitching, don't worry about it. So, we, we've gone in that direction. Now, I'm going to come down here and just lay down a little bit more stitching. Just to show you guys what else this means. So, we're going to have our stitching and it's going to go this way. And this is one of those things that tends to... really be unavoidable this is the one that's really unavoidable sometimes and you just kind of have to hope that it's not as noticeable now what i was saying earlier with it's your project you're just doing it here to be fun there's really no right or way to do it if ah, just because it's noticeable to you doesn't mean it's going to no be noticeable to any or to everybody there we go words and also a lot of times you, you're probably just going to be doing something and not really care. That's actually the vast majority of my pieces. Unless I'm doing something for a commission, I tend to not care a lot. Like uh, I will be working on something and someone will come into a stream and say, why are you doing it this way? There's another way you can do it. And it's like, because ah, I, don't, I don't care. I'm doing this because I'm bored and I wanted to make something pretty. It doesn't have to be perfect. So now we're on our second row and we're going down we are going down onto our second row but let's say for instance ah uh, there it goes couldn't find the rope couldn't find the hole let's say for instance this was a section where you were kind of caught where if you were trying to get there you had to either count 20 stitches up or 38 stitches down and it was easier to just go down the middle so we've got all this here and pretend that's 38 rows of stitching i'm not going to do 38 rows of stitching live just for a tutorial that's stupid so what you might wind up having to do then is you've gone down here this is the one that's kind of unavoidable and you won't notice it as much right here but it can cause a very obvious line in your stitching because our direction of stitching has been down. But now we need to come back up here to do those other 20. And like I was saying, you want to try to always stitch down into your fabric, which means that now our individual stitch direction will have changed because we were before stitching up into what we've already done now we're stitching down into what we've already done it's very very subtle the stitch leg direction is the same but the individual stitch uh stitch direction has changed because we're not stitching up into what we've done we're stitching down so when we do that it can kind of change or make just a little line. You'll get a little tiny line in your stitching. 
and that isn't necessarily what you're going to want. But again, sometimes it's unavoidable because sometimes counting 38 stitches, it's not easy. And you might decide that you would rather have a tiny line in your stitching than risk miscounting and then having to undo everything. So when people recommend that you always stitch in the same direction, they could be telling you one of three things. And unless you are specifically asking, hey, what have I done here that looks wrong? And they tell you, it might not be clear what's actually meant by always stitch in the same direction. And it's kind of the cross stitch of uh, equivalent of don't pray. Because yes, it's good information if it's used in context, but the vast majority of the time it's out of context and therefore unhelpful. But generally you want to always have the bottom half of your stitch facing the same way and the top half of your stitch. And you want to always be either your individual stitch going up or going down or going to the side generally. And you always want to be going either generally down, up, to the right, or to the left. You don't want to be switching between both. That, that's what's generally meant, but there's always reasons to switch it up. It can cause a few issues, like, I don't know if I can see that there's a difference between the bottom half and the top half, or if just mentally I know that I've changed things up, so my brain thinks I should see a difference. But if you have a big enough section, you will kind of see a difference. Now, we were talking a little bit ago about these white bits that you can see in here. And what would you do about these white bits? Uh, there are two things you can do. And I'm going to need to grab something from over here to do it. So there's two techniques you can use to get rid of those white bits. The easiest one is called railroading which um, is not actually a bad thing, because I know in other contexts, being railroaded is um, not good. So we have our two strands right here. If I poke, poke my needle through there, we'll see that there are indeed two strands. So when you go down, you don't necessarily have to do this on the bottom half of the stitch, but it does help. And I am kind of using cheaper threads, so it's going to knot up. So we'll come up through here, poke our needle through the threads, and then go through the hole. And that's all it is. And basically what that does is it convinces your thread to lie side by side. By side. It won't twist up. And we're just going to keep doing that. So. Eep. Get that in there. Go in between the two strands, down through the hole. It keeps getting caught on my starched up pinked edges. And there we go. And after I do a few stitches, you might notice a difference. Like I said, I wasn't really putting too much care into the earlier ones, because it doesn't matter. I wasn't really, you know, worried about how neat my stitches are when I'm just showing you how to do some basic stuff. Now you will notice this takes a little bit extra time, and as you get used to it, you'll find ways to do it more efficiently. Um, it also works better with nicer floss. I'm using dirt cheap floss, so that's not helping either. So we'll go down through here. And there we go. And you can kind of see a little bit of a difference. Not much of one. Uh, because we still are only using two strands on 14 count. Uh, another way you can get around having your fabric show through is just use more strands. Like when I'm doing my Kickstarter kits, I'm not concerned about railroading because I'm using four strands to begin with, so it's always going to be chunky no matter what I do. But when I put this down here, and you'll see, I can kind of do this. I don't do it super often. I'm not the most efficient at it, but I can kind of just guide the needle through where I want it to be. 
we'll do one more so that we can kind of compare the two. I've got this super starched fabric and the edges are all chunky because I used the pinking shears on it and it's not happy. There we go. So you can kind of see a little bit of a difference between those, a little bit. Um, although this guy here with his four strands, you can't see the plastic through them anyway, so I don't really bother too much with that. Another way you can do it, and this is more effective if you've got more strands of floss, so I'm going to just artificially give myself four strands real quick by folding that over. So here we go, get through. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, railroading is really effective, it just takes forever. There we go. So now I've got four strands on here and I will come up through uh, right here. So we'll come up through here. Let me um, oof. There we go. Needle fell off while I was trying to get that sorted. At this point, it might have been easier to just start a new one. Oh well. So there we go. Now, we're using four strands, which on its own, ugh, is going to be really chunky to begin with. Uh, but some people might not like that chunkiness. I'm just doing one stitch to tack everything down so that it stops being difficult to use. There we go. So what you can do is use what's called a laying tool. And you can get really fancy ones. I just use a big old giant needle. So what you do is not have a camera in your way. But you'll notice when you pull the threads tight over the needle, they're not going to bunch up anymore. They're just going to lie flat like that. And I put it backwards on there, so that's fun. We'll just kind of slide that out. And now, they're a little bit more even. And we'll do the same over here. Just pull the threads tight over the laying tool. And there you go. And now it's not as chunky. You get nice, even stitches with your multiple strands that you can't railroad. It's one of those things, you don't see it very often anymore though. Uh, just because it's kind of, I don't know, old fashioned, I think is a good way to put it. I'm gonna start a new thread now. It is a little old fashioned, so you don't see that anymore. Mainly because I think a lot of younger stitchers are very much in the YOLO camp. Where I'm doing this to have fun. This is something that I want to do I because I want to enjoy it. I don't want it to be a chore. Whereas a lot of older stitchers, the attitude is more, this is an heirloom and it needs to be precious and perfect so that my great grandchildren will enjoy it. But your great grandchildren aren't going to enjoy it. Your great grandchildren don't give a shit. You're a YOLO? Yeah. My hu my husband stitches too and he's getting ready for work. Because like well for me, because like you know it'd be different because you do stuff professional, so it does need to be you know, for me it's it's just the joy of completing a thing. Yeah. Like making something with my own things. Oh yeah, no, that that's exactly what uh, a big part of this Kickstarter thing is, and that's why most of the kits are so damn tiny. Here, have yourself some two hour instant gratification. Yeah. Because they're so quick to produce, but it's like, I made this. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Yeah, my husband is one of the uh, elves that's helping us te uh, finish things for the Kickstarter. We've got a few people who are stitching things for it. Okay. Write them down for me because I've still got a lot to go. You heading out? Mm, I love you. Bye. 
Okay. Yeah, like, the, uh, there's a lot. And this is just all of the really beginner, very basic stuff. Um, I'm not even getting into some of the really intense... I'm not touching backstitching today because, oh my god, I'm not touching beads. I'm not touching specialty stitches. This is just the very basic what you need to know if you want to get into the hobby. Because this is a hobby that's at least a thousand years old when it comes down to it. This is, this is old. This isn't just your grandmother's hobby. This is your grandmother's grandmother's hobby. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's really become, it's, it's really changed over the last few years. Funny enough, tent, are you reading my notes? Because tent stitch is the very next thing. We're actually just getting into talking about tent stitch. That's why I just re-threaded my needle. But yeah, like it's, there's so much that goes on in this hobby. And it's like my husband said, the way that I stitch, I'm pretty YOLO about it as well. And I do it quote unquote professionally. He does it as something to do at work. <laughs> Because it's 8 o'clock at night. He's about to go in for night shift at the nursing home. He needs something to do. So that's why he started stitching. <laughs> What's that? Uh, yeah, well, you're busy. I spend 16 hours a day doing this. So, <laughs> so yeah, we're going to get into tent stitch, uh, which Coop mentioned, which is really funny because that's literally why I re-threaded my needle is to start showing you this stuff. Uh, let's also go somewhere else on the fabric. Don't do whatever you just tried to do. We're going to go like right here. So tent stitch is one of those things that I realized you're allowed to do. It was one of those really weird epiphanies where I was like, I, I'm not doing these because they need to be an heirloom. I'm doing these because I want to create art and I don't want to sit here spending the next eight months of my life stitching a fucking Spider-Man, basically, is what it came down to. <laughs> uh, so I started doing this. The, the reason why I, learned, or I realized you were quote unquote allowed to do this is because we were helping a family member clear out his house so he could move to Texas or something. And his girlfriend had this really gorgeous needlepoint tiger up on the wall that she had done on plastic canvas with yarn. And I, th this was when I was kind of a babby beginner stitcher. I noticed that it wasn't cross stitch, which was what I did. It was all half stitch. And there's this really weird Venn diagram of cross stitch and needlepoint where there, there's a very big section where they are the same thing. Uh, needlepoint, basically your thread or your stitches are shaped a certain way. Cross stitch, your shapes a certain, or your stitches are shaped a certain way. And there's one stitch called tent stitch where it overlaps and the vast majority of what you see in my little slideshow down there showing off all of the crap that I have put years of my life into making, the vast majority of that was done with what is called tent stitch. So where are we? We're right here. So with tent stitch, we're gonna come down right about here. I wouldn't normally recommend doing this on 14 count. Uh, because it's too big and you need six strands of floss to do this effectively on 14 count. Normally I work on anything between 22 and 32 count. So doing two strands this way is a lot easier. But we're going to... For some reason I'm having a hard time finding the holes on 14 count. Come up, do our loop start, and there is our stitch. Now, if we're doing this on Ada, which is what we're on right now, you can actually save a lot of thread. And tent stitch at this point just becomes half stitches. So we're just gonna do a row of half stitches and you can immediately see why it doesn't work with two strands because, oh boy, that's a lot of white, but you know, pretend that it isn't, I guess. 
Oh my god. My allergies. Yeah, that, that that is another thing about this hobby. If you have bad allergies, um, invest in some really good medication. Because this will set all of them off. So, there is our row of tent stitch. There we go. Boom. That's done. So, we're going to come down here. And we're going to do our next row. And boom. Now, you'd want to use enough thread to where you get the illusion of a full stitch. Uh, what do I have over here? This guy is on 28 count. And uh, let me focus that so you can see it a little bit better. And you can see those are all half stitches. It's just the illusion of it being a full stitch because the weave is so small. So, there we go. We're doing this here and up until about 20 count, you can get away with doing half stitches. This is not technically tent because embroidery is one of these weird things where there are 800 different words for the same thing depending on how you move the needle sometimes so there we go that's two rows of half stitches which you can call tent and you wouldn't really be wrong because nobody's looking at the back and they can't tell you that you're wrong now if we're using even weave i talked earlier about your stitches slipping now if you look very closely i'm going to really zoom in on this so you can really see what i'm talking about now you can see that everything is woven together in such a way that there is no possible way for anything that is in this hole to slip over into that one. You need to take the needle out and put it back in for it to get there. And I can't do this while I'm looking at the screen. So you can't get from this hole to that hole and back and forth without taking the needle out. Now I'm going to grab myself some of that really nice 32 count because that's what I have over here and I'll show you this so we're gonna focus this a little bit better I think that's as well as that can focus now if you look this is not the same that is just a one over one very basic weave and if you put your needle here it can very easily slide over into the other hole that's bad we don't want that we don't want that at all so we're gonna zoom out a little bit and fix the focus and if we were using that 32 count the 28 count all the stuff i normally use we'd do this a little bit differently so how we would do this is we're gonna come up from right here and go from the bottom to the top and now we're going to come down here and go from the bottom to the top and we have magically gone from doing tents or from doing half stitches to tent stitch so what's happening you can't see this very well is the thread is right here right now and is being pulled to that hole right there so on the back it's going across two different holes and then we're coming up here to that one eek i am getting tangled up on my pants there we go so this way if we were using an even weave fabric like that 32 count if i were to pull this it would stay put if i were to pull that thread right here this would slide from being diagonal to the to the thread would be would slide and go that way it would go vertical instead of diagonal so what tent stitch does is it doesn't define what the front looks like because there's no visible difference between the front and the back they are identical on the front and the back what it does is it changes the way it looks on the back so i'll show you over here you can see and i'm gonna really zoom in so you can really see because this is nutty so we have let's see where would be a good way to good place to see it i'm not using the best colors on this one but you can kind of see here 
where this thread right here skips over where it should where it seems like it should have gone try to get, keep my hand out of the way it skips over where it seems like it should have gone and it goes up one more and it all does that which actually means that the back of any piece that is using tent stitch will have better coverage than the back of something that is using full stitch so yeah here you can see that they're really small the stitches when we turn it over onto the back they get longer yeah there we go we can see it here in its tongue on the edge you can see how long those stitches are on the back it's a very subtle difference but it makes sure that not a single one of these stitches slides over and becomes vertical because you can really see uh it's easier to see i think on the 28 count how a stitch could go from one hole to the other very very easily so what tent stitch does is just completely prevents that by changing the way the thread carries on the back and uh, there we go yeah they're in it's incredibly different and another thing it does very subtly which you can't see on 14 count because again it's designed to have this perfectly rigid square weave where very little you can do outside of destroying the fabric will take care we'll get rid of that but when we pull that thread from this from over here to over here we are making sure that this stays at a perfect 45 degree angle because we're um, we're pulling it back in the same direction. These ones, when we pull it up, you can't see that because it's behind the hero rat. When I pull this one up to come down and do the next one, it's slightly pulling that stitch out of joint, which is what causes it to slip up and either become horizontal or vertical because you're pulling it in the wrong direction you won't see that on 14 count you won't see that on 18 count you won't see that on 20 count if you're using fabric called ada which you can really tell the difference in the weave it becomes very obvious once you know what to look for you can use half stitches and nobody's going to notice it's once it gets into hardanger and even weaves where you can slip stitches that you need to do it this other way where you go from bottom to top and effectively do a double length stitch on the back, which is really bonkers. And it, does, it doesn't save you any floss over doing a full stitch, but it does save you loads of time and loads of frustration. So tent stitch, amazing, 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 amazing. Now another thing, let's find a new place to work. Let's go up here. We kind of ruined this area but that's fine we'll go up here for a while another one you'll hear a lot of is people talking about stitching over one versus stitching over two now if you're using ada this is almost completely irrelevant but trying to do any kind of demos on even weave is impossible so it doesn't matter so what we're doing all of these are stitching over one everything we've done down here is all stitching over one and what that means is on even weave, you probably saw that it's all single fibers. It is all single fibers right here. Thank you for hanging out. There's no special anything with the weave, which is what allows stitches to uh, slip and was, which is what makes it so difficult to work on. So if this were even weave, stitching over one means, come here you, stitching over one single fiber I have just stitched over one a lot of times you'll see people who want to do something big on a 14 or 16 count equivalent so they will buy 32 or 28 count and then they will do what's called stitching over two which is if each one of these were a single fiber I keep stitching myself to my shorts if each one of these were a single fiber, that's one, that's two. So now we have just stitched over two. And then we come over here and we do that. 
and that is a that that is two over two on 14 count which is really weird most of the time you'd see people do two over two on 28 or 32 which simulates doing two strands on 14 or 16 count and the reason why people do that it's a very simple thing we don't need to spend a lot of time on it but the reason why people do that is because you can see that ada has a very distinct rough texture whereas the even weave does not the even weave has this nice even solid texture so it looks a little bit more grown up there's this weird stigma uh, ada has for being children's fabric and i don't know why because i mean i've got some bomb ass ada over here that i absolutely love stitching on but yeah sure it's a children's fabric whatever but yeah, people will just absolutely refuse to use Ada, but then they'll want to stitch on 14 count, so they'll do it over 2 on 28. And then, I've tried to do it. It is so confusing. I cannot wrap my head around it. I used to do my beads over 2 on 22 count, because I didn't have a good enough uh, supply of 11 count. I finally have 2 yards of 11. So I can now do beads a lot more easily, because trying to keep, keep my head around how every stitch is actually two is really confusing because now if I had one down here I have to come down here and do this stitch so there we go and then my face is on fire uh so there we go there now we have a stitch that's say two stitches up from here well ordinarily okay zero one two Ugh. So if I go zero, one, two, that's two stitches. Stitching over two, that's actually one. So I have to remember, okay, no, uh, it's two stitches up, which means it's actually four stitches up. So uh, uh, there we go. Now I am two stitches up when I'm stitching over two, and it's just ridiculous. I can understand why people do it. I can even see the appeal, but my god, I hate doing it. So, if you see someone talking about doing a project over one, or doing a project over two, or seeing something that says one over one or one over two, one over two, the one refers to one strand over two, uh, over two uh, stitches, basically. It's kind of weird and complicated and really confusing to a lot of people. And you know what? I don't blame you for being confused because it's stupid. So now I am going to actually put my needle winder down here because I don't know why I'm not using it. Yeah, and like Crystal said, sometimes it's useful if a project has fractionals, which we are not getting into because that's one of those things that, you know, if, if you're a beginner and you're doing fractionals, fucking galaxy brain I guess I don't know <laughs> I've been doing this for ages and I refuse to do fractionals they're so stupid okay so now I'm, now I'm gonna move over to a different section I'm gonna come over here and cry because my face is on fire uh, and I am going to grab some variegated floss Give it to me! There we go. This is variegated floss. It's very similar to the other one we were using. It just happens to be the one that I plucked out. And you can see that there's a bunch of different colors going on in here. So I'm going to pull off a length. And depending on how you use this, it depends on, or depending on what you want to do will determine how you use it. And this, you can see, is some cheap-ass floss because I did not want to come off the skein very easily. This is just the junk floss that I keep around exactly for doing demos, so it doesn't really matter. I always like to keep a bunch of junk floss on hand so that I don't have to use my really nice expensive stuff. That costs more than anything should. So, we have or uh, we've also got a shadow from my microphone, so let's move that. <laughs> I didn't notice that. So as you can see as we move along, 
it changes color from not quite white maybe it does just about go white and then we kind of get like this nice creamsicle orange it's actually a really nice color so what we're going to do is there's a few ways you can use variegated floss and i want to show you some of them there's really no uh no limit to what you can do so the first way this is the way that i like to do it it gives you more of an over dyed effect over dyed flosses again here's one of those weird varied, uh weird venn diagrams they're both variegated over dyed just means there's slightly more color in one area than there is in another whereas variegated usually means that there's going to be multiple colors going on at once so here we have we're going to do it with a loop start so that we have at uh pretty much at any point there's a chance that there will be two different colors on the thread at the same time and we can get some extra trippy effects we won't see that really come into play that was a noise uh because i'm not doing a huge amount of stitching we're only doing a few a few stitches here oops so we're gonna do our loop start and pull that through and unfortunately i don't think this is going to really show up a whole lot at all so i'll try to do this very quickly and get to some of the really fun actually i know how i can do this i can just kind of uh, fake it so I'll pull it through to about right there and just make the back side a mess that's fine it doesn't matter doesn't matter I don't care so eventually you'll notice that the stitches are not solidly orange there's a little bit of white being introduced to them oh that baby's angry and very very slowly our stitches are going to get more white than orange there we go so we'll come down here just kind of do a nice little block of them and you can see that the orange is kind of starting to fade the white is getting more intense and I can kind of even force that through a little bit more just by not pulling it all the way through there we go the back of this is going to be a disaster but that doesn't matter <laughs> so eventually if you weren't trying to just do a little block of eight stitches you'd get this really subtle effect and this would also really change depending on what the floss you were using was if this had multiple colors you'd get all sorts of bonkers things but you'll see that our stitches went from orange to white there uh, they would have done it more gradually if i had allowed it to do it more naturally but there we go that is one perfectly valid way of using the variegated floss now if you did it the other way where you did the row of bottom stitches and then came back over and did the row of top your bottom stitch would have a different have a different gradient than the top so we're up here why not do it i don't know why i pulled everything off the needle Ugh. let me cut that short so that i can thread it more easily and this stuff's really cool um when i talk to my wholesaler i'm going to see if they have any variegated stuff that i can get on cones but here we go if i go boop no boop you can see there's a little bit of orange still on the thread and then we're gonna go over here and then i'll probably just force it over just to show you guys the the long-term effect over four stitches so when you come back later on after you've done the full row the top is now white 
I mean, I know it's kind of hard to see. I probably should have grabbed a more vibrant floss, but oh well. So the top has now changed the way the bottom looks, and it gives you this really funky woven look. So that's one way that people use it. And it's one way that well, people will start doing it and think they're doing something wrong because it doesn't look like what other folks have done with theirs. Because what other people will probably tend to do, and this is the more common way of doing it, is they will pull off one strand right here and then they'll pull off another one and this is where you'd want to use a waist knot this is why those waist knots at the beginning that we haven't been touching at all ever since became important so we're going to take those two ends and we're going to tie them together uh, try not to get caught on everything so just tie that together super quick And there we go. Now we've got that nice chunky knot right there. And as we pull the thread along, you'll see it just... Okay, have fun. Thanks for, thanks for being here. As we go through, both of the threads will change color at roughly the same rate. Uh, it's always going to be a little bit different because when the thread was dyed, it was wrapped around one another, which means inherently there are parts that are going to be longer and shorter than what was right next to it, but that's fine. And then you would just thread your needle. Eek. Come on, you. And do your waist knot. And then this is how you'll see people typically using variegated th uh, thread. And you'll get this really nice, subtle shift in color. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, I think I just grabbed onto the mess that's on the back from before. Where both the top and the bottom of every single stitch, you can't even see that, there we go. The top and the bottom of every single stitch are going to be the same. And you can kind of do what I was doing up here, but on a much smaller scale. And if you notice that things are starting to become out of sync, you just pull one thread a little bit shorter than the other. It kind of creates a little bit of a snarl on the back, but honestly, nobody's going to notice. And that is another thing that I think we're going to go ahead and end on. Uh, ended a little bit sooner than I had anticipated, but hey, that's fine. I need to go wash my face anyway. Is you'll see people, and again, it tends to be the Facebook biddies who just absolutely lose their shit over the idea that your back does not match the front of your stitching. I don't know why it's important to people. I honestly, truly do not. I think it goes back to the whole, it's an heirloom thing, but you know, I, I'm over here stitching furry porn. My, my, my family ain't gonna care about that. That's not an heirloom. I'm stitching it because it makes me laugh. <laughs> I don't care. So, the only time you really want your back to look nice, and it doesn't matter that it's not perfect, or it, rather, it matters that it is perfect and pristine, is if you're doing 4-H stuff. If you're submitting it to a competition at the fair, if you're doing something that is meant to be perfect and pristine, then yes, absolutely, take the time, railroad your stitches, make sure that everything is going in the same direction, don't put knots on your back, and make sure it's perfect. If you're just doing something because you're stuck at home in quarantine and you want something to do, who cares, <laughs> basically? My face is on fire. Like, basically, who cares? Why was that transition so difficult? How long do these usually take to make? Uh, these little guys right here, um, which I'm gonna, ow, I just pinched my finger in my light. These little guys will take me about two or three hours. My husband was kind of laughing about that when I said that earlier, because for him, 
uh, he work he does these at work. So for him, they'll take two or three days. For me, they take about two or three hours. Uh, the big pieces, uh, this one right here, I wouldn't call this one big by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, just because there was so much fiddly stuff, this one was about two or three days. And then this big one here, I do not anticipate having this one done until next year, at the earliest. Uh, that one just keeps getting sidelined, too. The standard quote that I have for a headshot, which tend to be about 100 by 100 pixels, so it would be about this size, usually um, in this level of detail, although some of them will get a lot more detailed. These, cont uh, these I average about five weeks. And that's just to give me plenty of time to make sure I didn't screw up or to fix any screw ups. But how long they usually take really depends on the person and they really depend on what you're doing. It's very, very subjective. There's no, there's nothing objective about art. There's nothing objective about a hobby. It takes however long it needs to. Do I ever get sick of staring at the same piece? Uh, yes. Absolutely, that's why I have like 50 projects going. Absolutely. Um, and that's even in my TOS for commissions, is that part of the reason why I have somewhat long estimates, yes, I probably could get your piece done in a week and a half. However, if I did that and just spent nothing but eight hours a day working on your piece, I would hate it. And I wouldn't want to work with you again just on this horrible subconscious level i definitely know where my limits are and i know how i know when i need to stop i can generally work on a piece for about a week at a time and then i need to switch so doing these little ones the pride things have been really fun because i've been getting a lot of instant gratification and then okay i've been doing these all week i've finished 10 projects this week let's go work on commissions and do that all next week and that's what I've been doing, and it's it's really nice to be able to do it that way, basically. But yes, absolutely. Uh, you can kind of see back here behind my skeleton. It's not really that dark in here. It's just the way I have my camera. Uh, you can see a whole bunch of stuff stacked up behind him. That's all works in progress. I've got this. I've got that. There's a big bird somewhere. I'm working on so many things. I switch around constantly. And that's so I don't get bored and I don't start to hate something. Because when I work on something, I can I can move. I can go really quickly. Um, but then I get really burnt out really quickly as well. So that's why I'm always working on something else. But this was a lot of fun. I really hope people got something out of this. Because I know it was very different. And it's not quite what everyone else is doing for panels over here. Um, you can check me out again. My link, Goat Robot, keeps posting a whole bunch of them. We've got this Kickstarter going. I mentioned this at the beginning. But we are creating a line of beginner kits. Not just cross-stitch. We've got perler beads. Right now, we're working on funding seed beads. In the future, we want to get diamond paintings up. And backers can get these little kits. And they are for pins, magnets. You can do hoop framing things. There's some samplers. We've got this stealth pride line that I'm really pleased with, um, which I'm not actually the one who is proofing those. Someone else is. But they are tropical birds. Most of them are tropical birds in the colors of pride flags. So if you want to stitch a pride piece, but you're not comfortable or able to do that openly, you can stitch these birds that just happen to match your pride flag. And they will actually come as like edutainment uh, packages. We're going to put information about the birds in there and really make it completely unobvious that this is a pride thing. That nothing on the packaging will mention pride. It will just come as a fun little bird project. So that's part of the, that's one of the ones I'm really excited about. So, so pleased with that line that we're introducing through the Kickstarter. You can check that out. Um, I have got some little made to order pins. I haven't listed the butterflies right now. All I've got listed are paws, but you can get any shape you want within that size. And that's fine. We've got those $15 each. I've also got custom commissions. 
um, starting at 50 for basically little headshots and then going up from there there's really no upper limit because what you decide to get will vastly vastly change the quote they go they get enormous i think the biggest size is shit i don't even know anymore because i've got better fabric so i don't know what the biggest size is right now but there's a lot of really cool things uh i'll drop my website because that has links to everything and you can go ahead and head over there um the what it's slightly different i revamped it for couch con so you'll have everything relevant to couch con right there on the front page apparently it doesn't work on some mobile devices though which is annoying annoying is you know what but thank you guys for hanging out this was a lot of fun i will be back tomorrow with a more typical stream i stream most nights uh but i start between uh 6 and 8 p.m and then on sunday we are doing what is called a stitchathon, which is going to be insane uh there will be a countdown doomsday timer on the screen and what you guys do to interact with the stream will determine how long the stream goes it will cap at 15 hours these things have a nasty habit of running for 15 hours but this was a fun different little stream i had fun i hope you guys enjoyed it does anyone have any more questions before we bounce for the night anything else yeah you popped into the couch con chat and then just vanished <laughs> yeah and i will be highlighting this i might even upload this to youtube i am not sure But this was a lot of fun. Uh, I was scrambling up until the last minute to get this ready. And I still didn't have everything I needed. But we got there in the end. I know, again, very different panel to what everyone else is doing. But I figured I'd kind of just do a big old long Q&A about all the things that I tend to get questions on about everything. So I hope this was helpful. Uh... One thing I really like seeing is new people in the hobby. Because it does tend to be known very much as a grandma hobby. It, it kind of is a grandma hobby. But there is a new ten, uh, trend with it to kind of uh, get a little bit more in your face and ridiculous with it. And it's a lot of fun. But you can check out my site. Uh, you can get pattern downloads. There's some free patterns. Uh, there's some cheap patterns. I have some kits on my dealer's den that we're prototyping for the Kickstarter if you want to get one of those and check those out. But I am going to go wash my face and get rid of these allergies and go make some lunch because I've been up for a very long time and I'm hungry. And I will see you guys all back at the convention on Discord. Uh, you can check that out, couchcon.org. Uh, get all of the information there. Uh, browse all of the vendors. Good, I'm, gl I'm glad people learned some things. I really am. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, you can ping me in the Discord. I am Milesy there. I'm pretty much Milesy everywhere. Uh, my socials are on my website as well. But thank you guys for hanging out. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I haven't got to do something like this for a while, so it was nice to put this together. And I will see you guys in the Discord. I'll see you guys later. Bye.